Chapter 211 Troublesome Armor Tell the Acolytes to Move the Hosts to the Ritual Chamber, We Will Perform the Dark Baptism at Midnight when the Hour is Nigh. It Shall Be Done. A large group of hooded people was standing in the middle of a village square that was seemingly deserted. The plants that had been here had long lost their shimmer, the roads were filled with weeds and the buildings were falling apart. It was clear that this place had long been deserted by its original inhabitants. At this point in time, the majority of the hooded figures were gathered before a spire. This spire was in the shape of a double helix that continued upwards as if two pointy monster tongues were curling around each other. Around it there were several of these acolytes, their words were incoherent for a regular person to understand but they were certainly chanting something. The thing in the middle of this unkempt village's square continued to give out strange waves of energy along with bizarre symbols appearing on I.T.S. surface. They were all kneeling with their faces down, slamming their heads into the ground. Even if there were rocks they didn't care for, they continued to chant and bow while their blood flowed into the soil. While they were wearing long robes the bony fingers beneath them told a tale. The man shouting out orders had a slightly different robe along with a large ornate staff that looked like a deformed tree branch. On the focal point, there was an obsidian gem that shined with an eerie glow whenever he shouted out his orders. The people that were listening to him were quick to follow his orders as they turned around to go towards their new visitors. A large group of merchants had made its way into their village. The wagons along with the people in it were being slowly pulled towards the inside of this town. Each and every person from the races seemed to be in some kind of dream state. They were all slumped over, the only indication of them being alive were their chests that were moving as they took in slow breaths. The various animals that were pulling these wagons were awake, yet there was also something peculiar. Their eyes were pitch black and devoid of life. Even when these strange hooded individuals approached them they didn't react. It was the reverse, they followed the instructions of the ones in this village as they pulled the heavy wagons towards the village square. In the front was the one containing what seemed to be the main force of this convoy and their first target. After it was pulled towards the square the robed ones turned towards the entry point that was in the back. There they saw two people, one of them was a large brutish looking woman. Opposite her was another person dressed in shiny silver armor. While the woman looked fully passed out the other one was in a strange position. The acolytes at first thought that he might be awake but without any reactions, they concluded that he had just passed out while sitting and with his arms crossed over each other. Take him. The people t hat were called acolytes moved toward the armored man. The two large people were somewhat blocking the way towards the inside of this wagon where a large portion of the guards was hiding. Yet once one of the robed figures grasped the man's wrist something they didn't account for happened. Gah. Without a warning the man's hand was electrocuted, his body went instantly limp and he dropped down to his knees. The others around him were quick to back away while in horror. In their minds this was an unforeseen development, could this person still be conscious? Yet even when they pulled out their curved daggers and waited for the battle it didn't come. Instead, they could see their perceived enemy just slumping forward. He appears to be affected by the great relic, there must be some kind of protective spell at work here. One of the men in the robes made his judgment known to the others that were still nervous. It made sense, there were various ways to protect oneself even when unconscious. The runes on th e armor quickly became apparent as they started glowing bluish light after the discharge to their ally's hand. We must be careful with this one, first let us get this large woman out then. After the first discharge of what seemed to be a lightning spell, they decided to be cautious. No one wanted to risk being blasted by the unknown magic. They also did not know what could set it off. Was it only touch or was there more to it? There were various protective spells, hexes, and charms that a person could be affected by. If they weren't careful someone could die or even worse cause their target to wake up from the imposed slumber. For this reason, they moved toward the sleeping woman first. This wasn't easy either as she was quite heavy, even with the increased stats their classes gave them it took more than two people to get her out of there while also making sure not to touch the armored person on the opposite end. This woman along with the others was then pulled to the side and onto a smaller cart. On it, there were already several other sleeping bodies that they would howl away towards the secret chamber. Their ritual could only be completed during late night hours, before it was too late they needed to get enough people there. Finally. After the heavy woman was out of the picture it was time to move the armored man that was in the way of the wagon's entrance. Touching him directly was out of the picture thus they decided to use some special bindings. This special rope was placed at the front of the wagon space where the man was resting. Then one of the robed figures brought out an unsuspecting bell which he soon used to produce a faint chime. 
His words were quiet but it was clearly a special chant that together with this bell was used to activate the hex. The regular-looking rope soon started to be affected by the chant. It was as if it was transformed into something like a snake covered in darkish energy. With the spell activated the chanter could from a safe range entangle the target's hands and upper body while making sure to not overdo it. As before when the rope started entangling itself with the man's arms and wrists there was a magical discharge. Blue lightning energy traveled through the magical rope but this didn't stop it. The item continued to wrap itself around the targeted person from a safe distance. Soon the rope was ready to be pulled by the people there and without a worry for their safety. Help me, brothers. The three that logged the large woman away returned soon to help their allies. They gripped the magical rope firmly and started pulling to finally get the man out of the cart. He was also quite heavy and with the way the rope was fastened it only made things tougher but in a minute all of them heard a large thud as the armored man dropped down to the ground. Good, now brothers let us pull him towards the others. Wait, what is that? After the man's body dropped down they continued to drag him along which made them unable to notice the change. After the impact, the armor started to give out a glow that began at the chest area. It allowed the runic spell to activate without them noticing, only when runes started appearing on the armored man's back did the robed figures notice. Various magical effects were activated in a second that manifested themselves before them. Firstly a large explosion of mana that pushed everything away from where the man was, this was followed by a seemingly random hail of mana bolts. This was a peculiar spectacle as they shot out of various spots of the man's armor that were exposed. There was no rhyme or reason to their direction as if the magic spell had trouble discerning the intended targets. The rope that was around the man was quickly eviscerated while the ones holding it backed away in shock. The Great One will protect us. The seemingly random monobolts that shot up suddenly changed direction and headed for the group of people that were messing with the armored man's position. But before the attack spell could collide with their bodies each and every one of them held out a strange medallion that produced a shield of dark energy. The assault didn't last for long and thanks to their protective medallions the robed figures remained mostly uninjured. Only a few received minor injuries from the initial pushback but no lives were taken. What was left was the armored man laying on his stomach with a magical barrier protecting his body. The man that used the magical rope commented on the strange sight. He approached with a stone in his hand which he threw towards the mana barrier. As he expected, the magical shield caused the rock to be shocked by the same blue electrical energy as before. What should we do? Asked one of the robed people while looking at the man that previously used the magical rope to entangle their target. This person must be someone important. This amount of magical protection is very uncommon. We need to report this to the Dark Enchanter, he will decide his fate. Leave him for now, this protective spell won't last forever. Th. Air target was still unresponsive and affected by their secret relic's power. There was no imminent danger to them or their cause. They needed to continue with their order first as the Dark Priests would certainly punish them if the people were not ready to accept the baptism. Later they could bring this up while their leader decided on the fate of this one. Dot. This should be it, just like before this thing instantly reacts when its runic structures are in danger of being destroyed. Roland was looking down at the horrific monsters that were climbing towards the large tree. At this moment he was standing on one of the large branches of this strange tree in the middle of the village. He had quickly realized that this place was just an illusion, very similar to the one he had witnessed all those years ago. When activating his debugging skill he could see runes everywhere. He was unsure if it was because this illusion was somewhat inferior to the one he experienced previously or if it was because of his GR oath. But when straining his mana senses he could feel a faint difference from the real world. This was probably not something a non-mage class could feel so he was sure the others would remain trapped inside this illusion. Then there was the discomfort he felt by knowing that his protective measures against getting affected by illusory spells didn't work at all. He had prepared several spells that should be able to shield him from such things beforehand but they didn't hate him at all. This meant that either this relic was just that powerful that the inferior spells didn't work on it, or that he was lacking the understanding of how this illusion was activated. Probably not the best time to worry about that, the people I was with probably won't be able to tell if this was an illusion, even if they did they won't know how to leave it. Thanks to his debugging skill he was quickly able to determine where the core of this runic spell was. When he was a low-level tier 1 runic blacksmith he had some difficulty breaking it but now things were different. He would be able to instantly get out of here and the monsters that were coming his way would not be able to stop him. But if someone else wanted to get out of here, they would probably need to do something more drastic. 
This whole tree was the center of this illusory spell. The only way he could see the spell being broken without knowing where the core rune was would be to destroy the whole tree instead. Yet this tree was huge and when damaged the person would find themselves being attacked from all directions. Roland was unsure if they could die if killed by these monsters or if the monsters were even capable of doing such a feat. Instead, he theorized that they would probably restrain the one under the spell in some fashion until the caster outside delivered the killing blow. Did the Abyssal Cult find me or is this about something else? While getting ready to destroy the core rune his mind was in disarray. The moment this was destroyed he would be put into tea. He real world where his enemies were waiting for him. The scenes of the past that he managed to forget started resurfacing. The image of the strange warlock and elf that stabbed him in the shoulder was the first to come back. If these two were behind this, would he be able to contend with them in his current state? His level was high for a tier 2 class and he had a better stat multiplier but was this enough to compete against true tier 3 classes? A lot of time had passed since his run-in with them so they would have probably gained more levels. Their gear could have also been enhanced which put him at a big disadvantage. There were no hidden allies that could help him here. He had gone through most of the people in the caravan and while some adventurers were above his level, they were not tier 3. Without anyone to rely on he might have to make a difficult decision that would most likely be detrimental to the people, he was with. Yet to know how his chances were he needed to get out of here. Finally, he pr est on a spot that was above the branch he was standing on. This time around he would not need to be too drastic. His knowledge of runes had already progressed towards tier 3 as he had gone through many schematics. With regard to that, he could consider himself someone that was one foot toward tier 3 but who lacked the permission to unlock higher tier skills. Before the monsters could get to him the world started crumbling around him. The whole place looked as if it was cracking as many spider-like threads appeared everywhere. Monsters that were after him all halted in their place as everything started to vanish and turn white. Soon like all those years ago he appeared back in the real world. Huh, what's going on? The first thing that he noticed was that he was not in his cart but laying down on his face outside it. The alarm in his armor was constantly buzzing and jolting his body with a small electrical jolt as it was trying to wake him up from his slumber. I see. The defensive routine was activate. D while I was out. Roland knew that enemies could be waiting outside. Like all those years ago he expected these cultists to be confident in their runic relic. Even back then when he woke up the tier 3 class holders didn't know it. Thus he believed that if he didn't show any signs of waking up he would remain unnoticed. Luckily for him even when he was down on his face and unable to move he could still monitor the situation. First, he disabled the alarm that was running to see if he could hear his enemies around him. To his surprise the whole place was silent, besides the buzzing of his mana barrier, there wasn't much he could detect. This brought him towards his next step which was to examine his radar. There he could see various dots moving around. The first thing that he noticed was the lack of any red ones which indicated that there weren't any monsters around. The number of people there was vast but there was something off. Why are there so many of them in one spot? Are they getting moved somewhere? Question mark. Many circles were overlapping over each other as if they were stacked in one location. It was clear that they were being moved towards one location which wasn't that far away from where he was in now. He could only speculate due to the shield that was around his body. Roland had implemented various features into his armor that would activate if he was ever knocked out cold or attacked when he was asleep. It seemed that these cultists had managed to drag him out of the cart but were unable to pierce the strong mana shield that utilized his vast mana reserves. Even when he was in the dream world his MP would continue to regenerate which seems to have saved him for now. There are two life signals close to me, did they leave some guards to monitor my situation? Roland could only speculate that the cultist found his mana shield too hard to deal with for now. Without being able to pierce the spell waiting for the mana to run out was the easiest solution to the problem. Even he would run out of MP after Mo. Re time passed. With that in mind he finally moved slowly tilted his head up. There in the distance, he saw a person dressed in a pitch black robe. They were standing with their head facing in another direction, in their hand, they had a suspiciously familiar dagger that when he saw made his shoulder throb. It's really those bastards. But this guy. Name. Zaxary. Classes. T1 Dark Acolyte L16. T1 Scout L25. The first thing that he noticed about this person was their low level. They didn't seem to be paying much attention as they continued to repeat some incoherent words while looking towards the middle of the village. There he saw a larger version of the spiral relic he had destroyed. That thing will be a lot harder to destroy. 
but this guy shouldn't be a problem. Now came the big decision that he was afraid to make. The way before him looked to be relatively safe, the guards around him were weak and he would probably be able to take them out with ease. The big question was, what should he do after freeing himself? Should he help the others or flee while the cultists were unaware of his escape? Chapter 212, Dark Ritual Hash dollar percent hash dollar percent at dollar three, greater than at dollar hash. A man recited something in an incomprehensive manner while looking towards a large double spiral tower. It was giving out a strange buzzing noise that was hard to make out and the glowing red runes pulsated whenever the noise was released. Perhaps if the person was paying more attention he would have noticed that someone was approaching from behind. Soon within a fraction of a second two armored gauntlets appeared from behind him. One of them went for his mouth while the other started twisting. The robed figure's neck was being twisted causing his spine to be broken in quite the violent way. But with the weapon in his hand, he could retaliate. Even though he couldn't turn around to see who was behind him, in a last-ditch effort he went for the stab. Yet instead of flesh being torn a scraping sound was heard instead. The dagger just slid off this armored assailant without being able to penetrate through the harder alloy. This seemed easier in movies. Roland's bad attempt at recreating a stealth kill from popular media went unnoticed thanks to his sound-canceling spell. Even though he was wearing heavy armor he had runic spells to shroud himself in the darkness. The man that he murdered continued to flail around even after he managed to snap his neck thanks to his enhanced strength. I got them both, but what now? After awakening from his slumber, he detected only two guards near his location. Everyone else was on the other side of this large monument. Even now it was releasing the illusory spell that kept everyone trapped and unable to fight back. There were a lot of questions on his mind as he was confused about what these cultists were doing. First of all, some time had passed since the illusory trap had been activated. This time around it took him longer to get out of it than before. Time seemed to work differently in these illusory traps, perhaps. Due to the size of this relic, it was harder to awaken even when getting out through destroying the core rune. His willpower stat that should aid him against attacks going for the mind didn't seem to work that well when this strange runic object was involved. It belonged to a cult of some kind of evil god, so he could only speculate that there was something besides regular magic involved here. Due to him being out cold for so long the cultists had enough time to pull him out of the wagon along with all the other people. Yet when he was looking at the radar everyone seemed to be still alive. For some reason, they took everyone to that one location. While thinking Roland sneaked back towards the wagon he was stationed at. Strangely enough, his backpack was still there along with Grishalda's axe and his weapons. The way to the inside of the wagon was open but it didn't seem that these people were interested in their possessions. They didn't take anything? These cultists weren't acting like bandits, the people were alive and nothing seemed to have been moved. All the weapons the soldiers had were still there, it even seemed that these people purposely avoided moving anything. Which was very confusing to Roland as he didn't know what they were trying to achieve. Were they just going to come back later to take it all? What's going on here? These guys' aim doesn't seem to be to rob this caravan. Do they need living people for some kind of ritual? After his run-in with the Abyssal Cult all those years ago he started doing research. There was not much that he could dig up as this cult was mostly shrouded in mystery. Besides the name and sightings of robed figures, there was not that much known about them. They seemed to work similarly to other evil god worshippers but were somehow able to erase most of their tracks. This relic that caused immediate hallucinations was probably the reason for it. Even tier 3 class holders were affected by them and easy prey. One thing was clear, this village had been in their grasp for a while now. This relic didn't just appear in the middle of it out of the blue. The buildings looked unkept and the vegetation was overgrown. Yet there were magics in this world that could cause hasten plant growth which made it hard to put a number on the amount of time they spent here. How were these guys able to remain unnoticed for this long? Isn't this village supposed to be a waypoint for many merchant caravans? This was the biggest question, if merchants started disappearing along with their wares then this cult would have been quickly discovered. Even this illusory relic needed to have a limit if too many people showed up it would probably be unable to affect everyone. It was probably made for smaller merchant groups and mind instead. Roland could only imagine a few scenarios in which they were able to evade discovery. One of these scenarios would have someone in power helping them erase their presence. Another one was more far-fetched that involved mass hypnosis but one seemed the M.O.S.D. plausible as it involved the merchants leaving this place alive. This would explain why they didn't touch the wagons at all but why would they go through all of this just to release the captives in the end? 
He had no idea what these people were thinking and this was not the problem now. A decision needed to be made, when the cultists were busy with the others he could just leave. These people were certainly assured that their relics effect could not be broken. They didn't even bother to place any sentries to watch him besides two low-level acolytes that weren't even looking his way. While leaving was the obvious choice if he considered his own safety there was a problem with that. The cultists would certainly track him down all the way to Albrook even if he reported it. He had no idea of knowing who was in cahoots with these people and if anyone would believe him. If his theory was true and these people actually turned up alive later, his statements would be questioned. Shit. The biggest problem was this guilt quest that he was taking. He was noted down as a runic mage that was taking a test. It wouldn't take a genius to figure out that it was him that escaped from here. So even when he returned home in a few months he could receive a visit from his old tier 3 acquaintances. Thus if he wanted to get rid of any future cult shenanigans he would have to free the other adventurers from the spell. Only if they confirmed his story would anyone believe him. Then if they managed to kill all of them, his involvement could be downplayed. Would the cultists try getting to the bottom of what transpired? Certainly, they would but with so many involved he would be given more time to decide about his next step. Roland gave out a sigh while taking out the two spider drones from his spatial backpack. Along with them he also pulled out two pouches with what looked to be large colored marbles. These were promptly inserted into the golem's compartments where previously was his radar range enhancer. While he had Desit, Ed to see what was going on here it didn't mean that he would be hasty. Perhaps fleeing would still be the only option left as he did not truly know the fighting capabilities of his enemies. Yet there was one certainty, there were no tier 3 class holders here. One of the most important features of his radar was danger assessment. Within the vicinity of this village, he only detected high-level tier 2 enemies. It was possible that a tier 3 could be hiding somewhere but it was not probably. Back in Albrook, he had tested his scanning system out on the Guildmaster and some Platinum adventurers. Tier 3 people had a certain mana fingerprint that was above the rest which made them easy to detect. It was not a measure of strength, just a way to make sure who he was facing. The strongest combatants seemed to be gathered in that one location behind the large spire. After the two golems were filled with the marbles they were given specific instructions to remain hidden. Luckily spells that cancelled out sounds were not that hard to come by. All thanks to this mapping feature the golems would be able to go through this field unnoticed. Just as ordered the spider drones skittered away into the night while quickly digging up holes into which they dropped a marble into. The moment the colored orbs dropped down they started giving out a faint glow that was quickly hidden by a thin layer of earth. While his automatons were working hard Roland started preparing. Inside his backpack, he had several pouches filled with more goodies for his enemies. There was also the biggest turtle that was this massive runic construction in the middle of the village. He was convinced that if he got too close to it the cultists would probably become aware of his existence. Yet destroying it would be important to his success as even with his current firepower and preparation time there was no assurance of his victory. But he was not alone here, with the help of the other adventurers and the guards his chances of winning increased. That small one was easy to destroy but this one won't be that easy. Without his mana sense, he would probably not be able to see it but there was some kind of protective enchantment at work there. If he unloaded all of his spells on this large double helix it would probably trigger the defensive measure. If he had enough firepower was debatable yet there was another way to disable it. This was nothing more than another runic creation similar to one of his own. It worked in the same way and even if it utilized some kind of divine energy it was not part of the runic software that could be switched off. Now there were two ways he could access this runic structure. One would be to go directly to it and go by touch. This would activate the protective measure it had which made this option difficult. Then there was the easier method which he would probably need to go with. The relic needed some kind of remote control just like a control rod for a golem. This control item would certainly be in someone's possession, probably in the hands of the leader. It would be much easier to figure out the shut of code with through it than to attempt it through the massive construct directly. Those sorts of items always had an imprinted set of codes that could be sent to the main runic construct. Some like the golem control rods had no protective measures and could be used by anyone holding them. While there could be something locking it to the mana fingerprint of the user, he had enough knowledge to get around it. The bigger problem was to identify the control item. As he approached the center of the village he continued to notice the vibrations in the air even more. Thanks to being sensitive to mana he could tell that this thing was giving off signals. This control item should be giving off a similar signature like this, perhaps my scanner can pick it up. 
his radar seemed to be coming in handy a lot more than he anticipated. Thanks to him setting it up to go for mana fingerprints he would be able to feed it the mana pattern of this ominous double helix. Yet, even after going through with that his mapping feature wasn't as precise as he had wished for. It was guiding him towards the area where all of the people were, it seemed that he would find it there along with a large group of crazy cultists. Finally, it was time, his main weapon which was the iron staff was now in his hand. On his back was a shield that had various protective barriers to keep him safe from damage. By his hip, he also had his sidearm which was a long sword for whenever someone managed to get close. Most importantly though he had his runic armor that allowed him to shatter the conventions between classes and levels. Even with all of them together he was still unsure if this was the right thing to do. Escape was still an option yet his current life would be over then. He would need to escape from Albrook and hide away somewhere. The cult would certainly know that he had a runic class now and perhaps even discover his new hiding place in time. He would spend the re-st of his life looking over his shoulder or perhaps be forced to return to the noble estate to seek shelter. Then there was Elodia, Bernier, and all the other people that he came across. Would they run away with him if he explained it all or would they remain in the place they called home? Would the cultists use them to get to him if they decided to stay? This was not something he wanted his friends to ever experience as he knew of the inhumane ways of the abyssal cult. Before he could cloud his mind with any more questions he decided to stop. There was no use asking himself hypotheticals before the battle started. If he didn't focus on the task at hand he would certainly fail. Thus while activating a concealment spell he slowly wandered through the deserted part of the village. The area he was in was quite silent but as he ventured toward that gathering place strange noises entered through his ears. There were people chanting something, it was very similar to the incoherent babblings of the two guards he h had disposed of earlier and only got louder when he approached. To evade detection he decided to stick to the emptied out village houses on the side. With the tall grass and bushes there and the help of his spell, it would be impossible for these cultists to sniff him out. Then finally on the other side of the large spire, he saw some of the enemies. There were about ten of them and they were kneeling outside a large building that was further away. This structure looked like some kind of temple that had been haphazardly constructed. The materials were clearly taken from some of the village buildings that he could see in the background. This whole structure looked like an unfinished pyramid that was flattened at the top. There were large stairs leading up a few meters to a large open door. The night was quite dark so the light from the inside was illuminating the way for him. More of those strange chants were coming from the temple-like building so he started wandering closer to see if there was a way to get there without going through the cultist from the front. After he went around to the other side he discovered some smaller openings at the upper parts. Thanks to the pyramidal shape it would not be hard to scale the wall even while wearing his heavy armor. There were no guards to be seen either, the trust these cultists were putting in that relic was impeccable. They clearly didn't expect anyone to be able to get here without being entrapped in the illusion. First I need to find an escape route. After examining his surroundings he looked at his two golems. These two would be an important part of his plan so they needed to be strategically placed on standby. Only then he started to scale the wall towards the man-sized opening at almost the top of this temple. From what he could tell this was probably made for ventilation purposes. Finally, when he reached the entrance point he was also able to peek inside. Without the walls in the way, the chants were quite loud. Yet this was not what he was paying a ten tie into. Inside he saw something that he didn't expect, something that he only imagined seeing in horror movies. The area in the temple was quite large and it was riddled with the sleeping bodies of the adventurers and members of the caravan. In the middle was an elevated platform and on it he could see one of the caravan guards. He was slumbering on something that looked like a sacrificial altar, yet instead of being stabbed through the heart as a sacrifice something worse was happening to him. Three priests were gathered around him, one to his left and another opposite while someone that looked like the leader was directly looking down at him. They were chanting something sinister while holding a slug-like creature in their hands. The creature was about five centimeters in length with strange tendrils coming out from its top part. Its head looked like it belonged to some type of leech with many teeth. As the chants continued a strange black shroud of energy surrounded this creature that gave out a strange high-pitched scream. What are they doing to these people? Soon enough the leech-like creature was passed on to the main priest that started lowering down towards the passed out man's face. One of the side cultists leaned over to spread the man's closed eyes. Then the moment the creature made contact with the man's eyeball its many tendrils shot out towards it. Roland was taken aback by the sight of this thing quickly wiggling inside of the man's eye socket and disappearing into it. 
He had no idea what the purpose of that thing was but he was certain that it didn't bode well for the people gathered here. Chapter 213, Trying to be Sneaky What are those creatures, the radar isn't picking them up as monsters? Are they too small to be registered, or are they part of some kind of spell? Roland was above ground and looking through a ventilation opening down into a large chamber meant for occult rituals. One of these was apparently taking place, the whole area was riddled with passed out people a and d more figures from the abyssal cult that he was familiar with. After making his way here to find the control item for the large-scale double helix device he found something he never expected to see. Small leech-like creatures were being inserted into people's eye sockets. Just a few seconds one of them vanished into a guard's eye and besides a little bit of blood, there didn't seem to be anything off. Instantly his mind went racing to figure out what was going on. After the run-in with the abyssal cult all those years ago he had gone through extensive research on the subject. Yet there wasn't much information about the real purpose besides the usual disappearances and murders. It seemed that the calling card of this cult was this double helix relic. With a magical device that could knock out even people at tier 3, it was easy for the cult to go unnoticed. Roland didn't have access to much information, most of it was clearly being hidden away by the information guilds and other powerful existences. The why we're not informing the commoners about facts concerning cults probably to not have widespread panic. Most of the second-hand information that was passed by word of mouth didn't amount to anything. Even when some cultists were apprehended they were taken away by the governing lord's forces. The only thing he could do was to spend large amounts of money at the thieves' guild that sold information. Even with that, there wasn't much on the cult, they mostly evaded curious gazes. Not even corpses remained in place and they vanished into the night after carving out their signature symbol. Without it most of the cases would not be identified and the afflicted would not even know if their loved ones had actually died. Roland had witnessed firsthand what these people were capable of. That one warlock that could transform into a giant monster was probably responsible in some way. The merchant group that existed in Edelgard disappeared in a day without a trace. If he didn't get out of the illusory world back then he, along with his old boss would have done the same. Luckily the old gnome had some powerful bodyguards that could contend with the cult assassins. There was no word of any incidents like that even when trying to get information through the thieves guild. Mostly there were just rumors of events happening that didn't seem to be related to each other. There were many assassination groups working in the kingdom and the cult had a good reputation yet there was no mention of these wiggly things they were inserted into people. That looks like some kind of parasite? What's its purpose? Take over the host body to produce more or is it something else? While observing the gruesome scene in front Roland came to a conclusion. He had heard about various ways of controlling others' minds and perhaps this was one of them. The way the little leech-like creature went through the eye socket without harming the person made it seem that the cultists weren't aiming to harm the people. If they just wanted them to act as some pa rossite breeding hosts then they were going through a lot of hassle. Why would they leave the whole caravan mostly untouched? They were probably going to place these people back onto the carts later on. Is this some kind of body snatcher scenario or something? While he did try to figure out what the purpose of those bugs was, this was not the time for his contemplations. Down below part of the adventurers and even regular travelers were already put through this dark ritual. If he didn't do anything all of them might become his enemies. If the parasites could actually control their hosts was a big possibility. His main plan was to get the control item and then free the adventurers from the illusion they were in. After this was done he wanted to use their help to take out the cultists. On the other hand, if all of them turned into some mindless zombies he would only back himself into the corner. Those guys seem to be fine for now but. In the background, he could see some of the adventurers behind hauled over. Dalrak and his small group were sprawled out next to each other. Orson had a strange smile on his face, it was as if he was having the best dream of his life. Grishalda on the other hand looked to be next in line for the ritual and the spirit spearman was right behind her. These guys are really convinced that nothing can awaken these people. I guess I should make my move. After going through the temples inside he had also discovered the item that he was looking for. The runic device outside was giving out strange mana patterns that he had stored. After a quick search, he had identified an item in there that he was looking for. Name. Lothor L139. Classes. T2 Dark Shaman L39. T2 Dark Priest L50. T1 Dark Acolyte L25. T1 Cleric L25. It was in possession of this man, this seemed to be the leader of the group that they all gathered around. 
At first Roland thought that it was the occult-looking staff in his hand but it was devoid of any runes. The only item fitting the job was a strange medallion that he was wearing around his neck. It had a double helix symbol in the middle along with many tiny runes. This would be his assault target which made things difficult. He was the person holding out the little parasites while the other dark priests chanted. What he needed to do was get to that medallion, through it in theory he should be able to send a signal to disable the large relic. Roland considered blasting the large spire with spells and some enhanced magic but he wasn't sure if he could blast through its defenses. The double helix tower was surrounded by some kind of mana shield that protected it from harm. The amount of mana he would need to put into a blast to get through it would be immense. It would surely drain his reserves and put him at great risk if he failed. Thus he decided to go with option B while this might have seemed like the more difficult task he had a few helpers to aid him. The two golems that he had taken along for this adventure were already getting into place. Here goes nothing, G. Without further ado, the haphazardly created plan of his was triggered. The two shiny spider drones were quick to follow the instructions that their creator gave them. From within their bodies, pointy rods started to slide out. They had cylindrical shapes while becoming thinner at the end. They were all covered with runes that at this point in time were shining blue. The drones lowered their center of gravity as they went low. Soon the runes traveled up the rod coming out of the top of their body to activate the spell effect. What shot up were simple mono bolt spells and while their aim was mostly to distract, killing some targets was not off the table. On the outside of the temple, there were several cultists that continued to chant. But soon enough they awoke from their trance by having their bodies being punctured by concentrated bolts of mana. Gah! One of the men screamed while falling down to his knees. The chanting cultists here were not of high level even a simple mana bolt from a spider drone was enough to maim them if the target didn't move. None of them were prepared for this but there were far too many targets to shoot down. After the second cultist went to the ground there was an uproar which was followed by the emerging of more targets. Brothers and sisters, we are being attacked. While some of the cultists remained kneeling on the ground some others emerged from the side. The sound of shouting and screaming soon got loud enough to reach the ears of the people inside of the temple. This caused the dark ritual to be paused right before a certain parasite made its way inside of a large muscular woman's eye socket. Who dares interrupt the secret baptism? How could anyone get through the Dark Lord's blessing? Is it someone from the Golden Order? The main dark priest started shouting while the outside was being bombarded with mana bolts. The other acolytes that were there abandoned the sleeping bodies and turned to their leader. Even while the shouting was happening outside they dnt seemed to react as they just waited. We do not know. Fools, go outside the baptism cannot be interrupted. While the few priests on the platform remained in place the others started rushing out. There they saw two hard-to-spot shiny spider golems. The two medium-sized constructs were hard to spot due to the various enchantments that kept their bodies somewhat shrouded in the night. Yet due to the constant monobolt salvos, they could be recognized even by these priests. But as soon as everyone rushed out the golems halted with their assault and quickly retreated behind the evil spire. The dark acolytes quickly followed after, in their hands they were mostly holding daggers, bows, and various other light weapons. While not many, there were some with magical staves that were able to protect their allies with some quick mana shields. The spider drones weren't as fast on foot as the people chasing them. They were soon discovered on the other side by the maddened cultists. Everyone here was quick to see HRG before the enemy constructs could continue with the magical assault. However, the first cultist had a rude awakening from his angry charge, as the moment he was a few meters away from the golem an explosion occurred. A large loud bang shook the area as the man's whole leg exploded along with the patch of earth under it. This man might have been the first casualty of the trap but he was not the only one. The maddened cultist had not paid attention to where the spider golems were leading them. Now they found themselves around a hidden minefield and soon enough the first explosion was followed by a second one. Arg. Uok. It was a strange sight to see, part of the cultists didn't seem to care for their health at all. They continued to rush towards the escaping spider golems and stepped into the place Trunic Mines. Only a few of the higher ranked ones quickly stopped as they saw the carnage unfold before them. Stop you fools. The mindless charge caused a lot of casualties but as soon as one of T. He few dark priests shouted the others instantly halted. It was as if these lower leveled acolytes followed through with their orders blindly even if their lives would be ended in the process. Use your bows. The man in charge was holding a magical staff in their hand. 
The moment the Dark Acolyte stopped with the advance the golems started attacking them with mana bolts again. But the leader was quick in reacting, while chanting he produced a barrier between himself and his people to block the incoming projectiles. Even when the smaller golems performed strange maneuvers they were unable to evade that many projectiles going their way. Spears, arrows, and even some explosives were coming their way and soon enough they were down on the ground. Even then they continued with their assault, the mana bolts only stopped after the last blow was delivered. The victory was assured, the mechanical contraptions had been defeated. Yet as the dark priest was looking at the destroyed automatons he felt that something was wrong. This was quickly followed by a revelation as he looked towards the dark temple in which a light show was taking place. All of them quickly rushed back while not even caring if some of the mines took out another batch of acolytes. When they arrived on the scene they were greeted by a large magical orb that was formed at the top of the ceiling. This orb was spinning around and constantly releasing magical bolts of energy. The dark baptism had been clearly interrupted, the dark priests performing the task were chanting out loudly while protecting themselves with magical shields. Everyone was in disarray as the constant bursts of light were making it hard to see. It's coming from there. Quickly my brothers and sisters, protect the temple of the Lord. There was clearly a mage sitting up there and casting this spell. It looked like a magical staff was above them and someone was holding onto it. Thus after a few shouts, everyone took aim for the area above their heads to bring down this intruder. Dark orbs of energy formed around the dark priests that took the shape of skulls. With their enemy now identified the magical projectiles quickly made their way up towards the target. The skulls promptly exploded bringing part of the roof along with them. Their victory was assured as the orb of light above them quickly diminished in size and vanished. But instead of the body of an enemy hitting the ground there was something else. It was clearly a magical runic staff with a large gem on the end but it had a strange apparatus attached to it. The shape was rectangular and when it fell down to the ground the inside produced some cylindrical shaped objects that did not explode. Wait. Where is the head priest? Everyone looked around but to their surprise, their leader was down on the ground. There was a wound in his back which indicated that he had been stabbed through it. Well, that seemed to have worked but I probably don't have much time before they find me. Roland was now hiding within one of the abandoned buildings. In his hand was the runic medallion that he had taken from the body of the head priest. The plan was simple, while they spider golems distracted the cultist he would take the item in question. This was easier said than done as even after they had started the distraction a lot of people remained inside the dark temple. While he could have jumped down and battled it out he would not have any time to work on this medallion. Thus he had used a second diversion that utilizes his previous mass guiding spell. After marking all of the remaining cultists he had lodged the magical staff into the wall. In his backpack, he had a spare battery pack to which he could connect this staff. While it continued to churn out spells he quickly made his way towards the second ventilation opening on the other side. Then during the chaos that ensued, he sneaked up on the priest to take him out. The man did not expect to get stabbed from behind. I got their attention now. Roland could hear various Madden SH outs outside. His deception had been discovered and they were now looking for him. It was time to quickly decipher this contraption, if he was unable he would need to go against a small army of angry cultists. With how they were able to protect themselves with magical barriers they would not be easy targets for someone like him. Without the aid of his ranged spells to clear out the large number of meat shields, he found it unwise to confront them just yet. But he did not panic, the runic medallion in his hand was already being deciphered and soon enough he would wake his companions. Chapter 214, Hacking Some Runes. We must retrieve it, find the intruder. After the head priest had been stabbed in the back by an unknown assailant the whole place was in an even bigger uproar. A few deaths had occurred during the obvious diversion but there were still many angry cultists around. They quickly noticed the treasured magical item that adorned their leader's neck was missing. This was not something th that could lead this place, some of their darker secrets were attributed to that item. Find this heretic, they could not have gone far. This was the truth as Roland had to duck into a nearby building after his trickery was discovered. Time was of the essence, if he couldn't figure out the inner workings of this strange medallion he would be unable to wake up everyone from their slumber. Without his allies, it would be difficult to escape as the number of cultists was too much for him. Kaboom! A sound of an explosion entered his ears and was followed by a cry of a cultist. When retreating he had spread all the remaining explosives around this area he was in. It was clear that he didn't have much time as they were coming this way. Soon they would probably figure out that he was in this house. 
Thus he quickly activated his runesmithing skill to access the internal structure of this strange magical device. Luckily for him while the large double helix outside was in possession of a greater rune or above th, is one wasn't as intricate. Good, it's just a high-grade common rune, where's the structure that is responsible for communicating with the main relic? From his experience, he knew that if he tried to activate this thing with his mana it would go sideways. This had been clearly made with the Dark Priests in mind and was attuned to their special mana fingerprint. Perhaps it also had a bit of evil god energy mixed into it that would not be possible to recreate by someone not in the cult. Roland knew all of this as he had already created similar long-range tools that worked like remote controls. After some fiddling he had found the correct structure, now he only needed to go around the password that only allowed cultists to use it. This was a delicate process that normally was not to be rushed. What he needed to do was to alter the structure to fit his mana fingerprint instead. This would cause a large change in the structure that could introduce other mistakes into the runic item. These would need to be altered as well to access the main program inside and finally send a disabling signal to the double helix-shaped device. Wish those guys could be a bit quieter but I think that I don't have much time left. There was an obvious larger concentration of traps around the house he was hiding in. It was a combination of explosive marbles and other small devices. While some of the spells only exploded taking out the feet or whole legs of the cultists, some were more complex. Right at this moment as Roland was altering the medallion, the cultists were witnessing another monobolt trap. After getting in range that didn't require stepping into it, the spell caused the marble to jump upwards. Then instead of a regular explosion, it caused something akin to a shrapnel grenade to go off. This depending on the opponent would cause less or more damage. Luckily they were humans that had many exposed spots. Without any heavy armor protecting their bodies most of the cultists approaching the building received many deep eye injuries yet with time they had decided to surround the building he was in. I can sense the intruder's presence, he must be in there. Soon about 20 cultists were rushing in like madmen towards the house he was hiding in. Even with the many explosives in their way, they couldn't be stopped. The dark priests used their spells to protect their foot soldiers from the magical attacks which allowed them to burst through the door. Yet instead of the intruder, they discovered something else. It was an emptied backpack along with some strange metallic contraption. Before they could realize what it was it started giving out a radiant glow which soon blinded everyone there. Our retreat. It was too late even though the dark priests that were standing in the back created a barrier around their foot soldiers still the ensuing magical explosion was too strong. The entire building was taken out along with all the people that had rushed inside. The ground shook for a moment and alerted everyone to this position. T. Here goes my backpack. Roland had quickly tackled down one of the walls while surrounding himself with his own protective barrier. Now he was running for his dear life while still working on the magical item in his hand. His cover was blown and he had gone through all of his explosives. There he is brothers. Shit. The explosion had brought every cult member to this position. His armor that was constantly giving out a runic glow was easily spotted. But this was not the end, he still had a chance as finally, he was able to jerry-rig this medallion while the whole village was after him. The only problem was that due to this hastily put together solution, he needed to make his way back towards the main relic. It was time to make his last big push so finally, he took his kite shield. While lowering his head behind him he started running. Unbeknownst to his enemies, this protective shield had a handy feature. On the front, there was a small orb, a tiny golem eye that fed information directly into his helm. Et. This allowed him to sprint toward his destination without the need of peeking his head out. Even when the bolts, arrows, and skulls made from dark mana flew his way he was able to defend against them. With a protective barrier around his front, he was able to charge through his enemies towards one destination. Yet to the cultist he was only boxing himself in as soon enough they surrounded him around their great relic. You have nowhere to run heretic, you will tell us how you were able to awaken from the dark dream. Oh, will I now? Roland's back was now facing the large tower that was still active. Even now he could feel the strange waves of energy radiating from it. The cultists seemed to increase in number, some of them were occupying the houses only coming out when an intruder was spotted. Now the whole village was out for his head, with how many opponents were here even with his armor this would be an uphill battle. But before they could charge toward him he held up the precious item that A. Wanted. You want this? The moment the cultists saw the medallion they stopped in their tracks. He knew that they didn't want this item to be destroyed but they would probably not let him leave with it either. However, 
this was just another small distraction, while holding it out in front of his body he activated a small spell. This spell wasn't meant to damage but blind his opponents as it was just a concentrated flash of bright light. The medallion was just used to get the cultists to focus their eyes on this one spot. Then as the flash of light momentarily disabled their advance he pushed the altered runic item towards the double helix relic. Only when the two objects were touching each other could he deactivate it. You will regret that heretic. It didn't take the abyssal cultists long to recover from this little distraction, when they came to their enemy was still there. He had taken up a strange position on the ground with his kite shield's bottom end touching the ground while he was kneeling to WN. Soon a large blue barrier of light surrounded his whole body. The maddened cultists quickly rushed towards the man that was clearly just stalling. Yet the moment they got too close they were repelled by the shield he had produced. Their cursed daggers were bounced back along with their spells that only caused the shield to crack slightly. Was this the right choice? Will they wake up in time before they can get through my shield? He he he. Take this. Huh? Hey, what are you doing back there? What the? Where did the tits go? What is this? A rather surprised Orson was looking at a dwarf posterior that he was holding with both his hands. The large village girl breasts that he was just playing with turned into his adventurer's partner's posterior that he was now fondling. Almost instantly he jumped back in horror just to collide with another random body he was on. Get off me. Hey who stepped on me? What the hell is this place? Soon the voices of many were heard by everyone here. Orson Lou head down to see that he, along with Darlock, were on top of a pile of people. It was a mix of adventurers and regular passengers that he had gone on a transport mission with. The last thing that he remembered was him having a nice time with a voluptuous village girl. These people had left a long time ago while he had decided to remain here along with his party members. Both of them had hit it off with the locals and even had planned to be married soon. T there is something wrong here. What are those creatures? Senna called out from the side. She was down on the ground and looking into some kind of basin of water. There was a small flight of stairs in the middle of this place that led up to some kind of ritualistic altar. On this altar, the large barbarian woman was sitting with a confused look on her face. This was not the strange thing as Senna pointed out towards the dark murky water. When he narrowed his eyes to focus he also noticed a large amount of leech-like creatures wiggling around in it. The SM, all tendrils around their bodies were flailing all over the place which made them look quite disgusting. Hey, weren't we in that village? But didn't you leave? Asked Orson while getting off from the pile of people around him. The question was posed to his halfling party member that quickly made her way towards her two companions. The village? Yeah, I was about to win 10,000 gold coins from that stingy merchant but then I woke up here, wait did you hear that? Everyone's senses were still a bit groggy after they woke up but soon they heard people shouting. The voices were coming from outside and they only got louder. Hear what? Someone just said, kill the heretic? Senna's class allowed her to hear a bit further than everyone in her group. She could clearly tell that there was some kind of commotion outside. Something is wrong here. Luckily my daggers are still here. Where is my halberd? Dalrak replied while looking around. Orson was in the same boat as his two-handed sword remained back at the caravan. My sword is missing too, hey, doesn't that belong to Wayland? Orson pointed to the runic staff that was sticking out from the side that was left by Roland as a distraction. The hell did all the meat go and what's with all that shouting? Finally, Grishalda shouted out while also standing up from her spot on the platform. She had a good view of the whole room below her. Most of the people from the caravan seemed to be here. There were some that weren't waking up though and they all occupied the space to the side of the room. Was that some type of illusion spell? Before people went outside a certain young woman brought up this possibility. The other adventurers looked at each other and soon began making their way outside. There they witnessed a shocking turn of events. A large group of hooded individuals were gathered around someone, they couldn't make it out from this spot but the person was clearly getting attacked. This doesn't look good. All of us might have been affected by some spell cast or spell, everyone get your weapons, expect those robed people to be our enemies. The guard captain was amongst the ones that had woken up as well. He was quick to assess the situation and finally everyone that could fight made their way outside. While they were leaving the people that had gone through the ritual remained asleep. Some of the non-combatants remained back to look over them. Walking them up proved impossible even when they were dragged from the pile outside and fed various potions they were not waking up. That is besides one person, a certain woman's hand started quivering. 
After more time had passed her body started to rise which caused the remaining people to back away. Roland found himself being assaulted from all sides. Thanks to his mana reserves the shield was quite sturdy but it would not last him forever. He had made a gamble by activating the medallion to free everyone from the relic's effect. If this didn't work out his only way out would be to rush T. Ards the cultists himself. While he was strong there were too many targets even for him to handle. The moment of surprise was over and his enemies had their own mages as well. Normal spells would be probably protected against which would put him at a disadvantage. But he didn't worry as while turtled up behind his shield he was checking his runic radar. There he noticed something important, the dots that represented the other adventurers started moving. He had been successful with his plan and they had awoken from their slumber. I need to time it right. Thus he continued to wait, only when his allies had finally rushed outside to see what was happening would he have a chance to get to a safer location. Hey, who are these cloaked people? Are they from some kind of evil cult? The voices of the guards and adventurers started becoming clearer as some of them that still had their weapons appeared behind the large gathering of cultists. Luckily they didn't bother to strip them of their belongings as they were probably planning to send them on their way after inserting those parasites into them. Now. This was his chance, for a moment his enemies let up with their charge to look behind them. With the pressure lessened he could charge towards the wagons where most of the armaments were still at. The runes on his armor glued brightly while being mostly concentrated on his legs. With a quick increase in his agility, he finally moved his shield up and charged for the most obvious blind spot in their formation. With enemies coming from behind them the cultists started to become disorganized. With a lot of resistance, Roland burst forth with all his might. On his way, many robed members bounced off his mana-covered body. The opponents were large in number but they certainly lacked skill in combat. Their equipment was also light which allowed him to bully his way through. Hey, you're going to need this. The first thing he did when appearing at the cart he previously occupied was to grab the large axe. Even W. I thought it Grishalda was already knocking out smaller cultists with her bare fists. She had quite a surprised look on her face when her weapon landed right next to her following Roland's throw. Kill the heretics, leave no one alive, they have seen too much. Screw off. Replied the large woman while decapitating one of the cultists after regaining her weapon. While the Abyssal cult members shouted out in a frenzied state they were quite an unorganized fighting force. This could be only attributed to their unwavering belief in the relic that could disable everyone. They did not have the right weapons to go against seasoned adventurers and guards. The daggers they used could not stand against the long spears and blades they were up against. A battle between the two parties erupted which the higher level adventurers were winning. With Roland's help, they were slowly driving the enemies into a defensive battle. The few dark priests surrounded themselves with the lower-leveled cult acolytes but even the Midas heels were running out and if this continued they would surely lose. Brothers and sisters, we must not let them escape, for the Dark Lord. Then as the battle was almost over, the cult members did something that no one expected. Each and every one of them gripped their dagger tightly and plunged it deeply towards their hearts. What are these crazy bastards doing? Called out one of the adventurers while backing away. It looked as if the enemy group was committing suicide to evade being captured for questioning. Yet there was something strange about this as the two dark priests that had survived continued to chant something. Yet they soon delivered the killing blows to themselves to follow suit. A large pile of dead robed figures was now drenched in black blood that sunk into the land beneath. Victory seemed assured however before anyone could check a strange occurrence took place. The pile of corpses started being surrounded by some kind of dark mist. This mist started quickly eating away at the dead flesh which turned gelatinous. The dead cultist turned into some kind of pitch-dark blob of mutilated flesh. What the hell is that? Roland called out while quickly shooting out a beam of concentrated heated energy towards this mass of dark flesh. Though even when the spell cleanly connected the metamorphosis continued to progress until a truly terrifying creature was before them all. Name. Abyssal Abomination L? Chapter 215, Not Looking Good name. Abyssal Abomination L? Roland felt like he had been in a situation like this before but this time around there was no tunnel to collapse to get away from the tier 3 monster. All of the people from the cult had combined themselves into some kind of strange abomination that was hard to describe. The whole transformation unfolded before his eyes. After the cultists stabbed themselves with those pitch black daggers it all started. Their bodies began turning into the same color as their weapons while quickly melting. 
Their skin was first to go and their muscles and organs were quickly revealed to everyone. Everyone looked in horror at the strange phenomenon taking place. Some of the commoners started to vomit the instant they saw the convulsing dead bodies on the ground. Yet this was not the end but just the beginning. The carcasses started being molded into something and quickly slithering towards one of the dark priests that would act as the core of this metamorphosis. It was as if the bodies were being affected by some type of gravitational spell. While partially melted they started quickly flying towards one location and combining with each other. At first, it started off as a mass of mashed together limbs and organs but soon the human appendages started taking on a new form. A plethora of tentacles with smaller tendrils coming out from them soon started appearing. All of the squishy flesh that looked gelatinous at first took the shape of pitch black leathery skin that was this monster's outer shell. Many large and small eyes riddle all of its body along with similarly spaced out toothy mouths. One of these was noticeably larger than the rest and occupied the upper front of the monster along with the central eye. The hell is that thing? Nikolaus the spirit spearman called out while everyone was shocked at the spectacle. While this was a terrifying display Roland didn't seem as affected as the others. This monstrosity was giving out strange groans as it was taking shape which seemed to be causing some form of a mental debuff. It was keeping people from reacting to the change and letting this creature take its full shape. Won't get a better chance than this. Roland was quick to realize that this would be the best moment to strike. Before the abyssal abomination fully took shape he had some time to launch a magical attack. He did not have his staff anymore and had to blow up his backpack while running away. This left him with only his armor to perform this task. This reminded him of the clash with the dinosaur monster from the dungeon. While he would be using a similar spell like last time it had been improved. He did not need any large external components besides one small add-on that he still had on his side. While his backpack was gone he still had his little satchel with some ammo inside. I can't do this too many times, my armor won't be able to take the load but better if it breaks down before this thing can form itself. He knew the dangers of straining the armor's runic components. His mana reserve was large and with the ability to alter the spells he made it was easy to utilize it all. Even when the monster was not formed and lacked a level it was very obviously above tier 2. The longer he waited the stronger it would become. If he could not take it out now then everyone would be in danger. Thus he stepped forward to get a good vantage point. With people being stunned from the strange low and high heated screams he didn't need to worry about hitting them. After planting his legs firmly on the ground he moved his hand towards his chest area where a barely visible circular indentation was. Previously he removed a red colored gem from his satchel, this gem was quickly inserted into this depression. Almost instantly a runic circle appeared around his chest plate where he placed this jewel into. Thus the countdown began while he stood out with his chest pointing toward the monster. His whole armor began glowing brightly, and the somewhat torn up robe he was still wearing quickly started going up in flames to reveal the shiny silver armor beneath it. His hands were held in front of the glowing stone in his chest area to aid in the forming of the beam. Roland felt his mana instantly being drained to activate this spell. While he would rather use some pre-prepared explosives he didn't have any. Instead, he needed to deal the most amount of damage in the shortest amount of time. Soon the beam was taking shape as the area around the gem started to give out arcs of blue electricity. Some people that were previously panicking had snapped out of their stupor just from the sheer amount of magical power that was being used here. Right before the stream of energy took shape Roland quickly activated his rune overload skill. Instantly the blue light that was covering his whole body shifted into a dark red. The runes on his body started eating away at the metal that it was made from. Thanks to it being of high quality the process was slowed down and finally, the attack flew out. Roland's feet were jolted back as if he was shooting off a high caliber rifle. The dark red beam of concentrated mana drilled its way towards the screaming monster that was still gathering the corpses of the dead cultists. A resounding explosion that blew up lots of smoke followed shortly after this display of magical might. The monster's groan was quickly heard by everyone. This finally managed to snap everyone out of this strange debuff effect they were being affected by. Yet before they could realize what was going on, their faces were hit by strong wind containing sand and gooey monster parts. What the hell? Get away! Everyone jumped back while covering their faces from the incoming debris. While they could not move their bodies due to the stunning effect they could still see everything unfolding. After backing away all of them looked to the sparkling armored man that was still radiating energy. Was that enough? Roland wondered while moving his hands down. The red light that was covering his body along with the sparkling runes started to dim. 
It was soon replaced by a bluish hue as he activated his rune mending skill. While the attack was powerful and reached into the tier 3 realm he was not sure if he wouldn't need to fire it off again. The jewel that adorned his chest area quickly crumbled to dust after the long-range spell had been completed. More than half of his mana was gone now and a migraine was fast approaching. Only thanks to the pain resistances he continually received was he able to still focus on the unfolding battle. Did he do it? Asked Nikolao. S. that was the highest level adventurer here. After recovering from the illusory world he had recovered his spear to fight along with the others. Seemingly Roland had managed to deliver the last blow as the monster's shrieks had gone silent. Fuck, that scared me. Orson called out from the side while holding his large double-handed sword over his shoulder. He, along with Cena and Darlock looked somewhat exhausted after the small skirmish. Aye, they should reward us plenty for bringing down a cult. The dwarf cheered as he already could see the increase in wages for bringing this village to light. The merchants probably wouldn't increase their wages but there was a bounty on abyssal cultists in the kingdom. They would be rewarded for each of them slain along with any occult relics returned. With how large this helix spiral was, the amount of money they should receive would probably last them many months. Shut up you idiot, that thing isn't dead yet. Hey you watch out. But while Orson and Darlock were nodding at each other, Senna could tell that something was wrong. Due to how much energy Roland had burned through his radar system was also lagging behind. But the monster would not wait for them to reassess their situation, the only thing on its mind was to kill. From within the dust cloud, a myriad of tentacles shot out toward the closest people to it. Unfortunately for Nikolaus, he was in the line of sight of the maddened monster that had been injured by Roland's attack. Even though he was a high-level tier 2 class holder he was unable to react in time at all. Unk. Huh? The old man could not even perform one defensive maneuver before he found himself being impaled by several thumb-thick tendrils. These squiggly things traveled at a speed that he could not follow at all. Quickly his body was hoisted up into the sky along with a couple of other unlucky bastards that were too close. Was my attack ineffective? Roland was sure that he managed to hit the monster straight on. He had faced other tier 3 monsters in the form of those dungeon skeletons. By his calculations, this condensed beam of energy should have been able to kill one of those skeletons in one shot. The way it worked was quite rudimentary. The mass of mana would spin at supersonic speeds which would go through the enemy's defenses. Once inside the body, the spell would shove chaotic mana into the body making it explode from the inside. This was a spell that he came up with after contemplating the creatures with strong outer defenses. Most of the time the troublesome part was getting past these defenses to get to the squishy insides. When those crumbled it was mostly over but for some reason, this monster was still standing. Finally, the dust had cleared and he had a good view of the aftermath of his spell. The first thing that he noticed was the large gaping hole inside of this black mass of tentacles. Yet even with this size of an injury, the monster was constantly putting itself back together. Nikolaus the unfortunate spear user was on e of the reasons that it was probably able to do this. At this point in time, his body was being drained of all its blood and flesh. The tendrils that went through his body were bulging out while transporting nourishment towards the main body that was mending itself. Name Abyssal Abomination L209 Level 209? The creature had finally formed itself and its level was revealed. Tier 3 began at the 150th level and with each consecutive level up the gap between Tier 2 grew. While it was possible for a small group of high-level Tier 1 class holders to defeat a lower-level Tier 2 this was not the same when it came to fighting Tier 3. With the gap in multipliers being higher and the rise in stat increases with each level it was impossible for a small group of Tier 2 class holders to defeat a Tier 3 monster over the level of 200. Even Roland, who had enough time to prepare a devastating spell could only wound it before it started regenerating. Can I hit it again? Will I have enough time to gather a new GH mana? Roland was not sure what to do now, he still had three more gems to perform the same spell. The biggest problem was that now the monster was on the move. While it wasn't moving from its spot much the various tentacles and tendrils were. Its counterattack began by inserting those appendages into the ground. Fuck. Everyone get back, the attack is coming from underground. He shouted while activating his agility runes to increase his speed. This was just in time as a large leathery pointy tentacle shot up from the spot he was in before. He had been successful in dodging but others weren't as fast, some people instantly got impaled and had their bodies hoisted into the air where the absorption process quickly began again. 
Even before the monster utilized its many mouths its victims were being digested. But some of the stronger ones that didn't instantly die were pulled over towards the larger mouth to be promptly tossed inside. The crunching sounds that were produced along with the screams of people it were truly horrific. Many individuals that were here were non-combatants. The screaming of women was followed by a stampede in all directions. The victory was short-lived as the Tier 3 monstrosity started going after everyone. Even with some adventurers being able to react to the tendrils and the guards the people didn't think they could win. What is this thing made of? Orson cried out after managing to dodge one of the thinner tentacles. It seemed that the further away from the main body the slower these appendages became. At a distance, they were dodgeable by Tier 2 class holders but even when the swordsman used a cleaving skill his large sword couldn't get through the darkened flesh. Instead, it got bounced off as if he hit reinforced rubber. Roland approached this same exact spot, with his own runic sword in hand he attempted the same feat. Instead of using skills he used magic, the runes on his sword began glowing blue and surrounded his weapon in something that looked like energy. His armor boosted his strength to an inhumane amount but even he could feel the monster's body somewhat resisting the cutting motion. Yet it did give out but at the cost of using a large amount of mana and using a special magical weapon. Not many people here were in possession of weapons that could harm a tier 3 monster. We must retreat, this monster will massacre us all. The appendage he cleaved through continued to wiggle on the ground before transforming into a glob of black liquid. It was clear that they were ill-prepared to defeat this monster. His magic was capable of harming it but as long as it could grab people to regenerate itself it would be of no use. There was also a large possibility that it possessed various other regenerative skills as well. These types of monsters always have some kind of weak spot, if we find it then we might stand a chance, can you use that spell of yours again? Senna asked Roland while all of them started backing away. I'd need half a minute to prepare and I don't think you'll be able to keep it busy for that long. The halfling clicked her tongue as she knew that the moment they got close to that thing they would be instantly impaled on those tendrils. While Roland could use ranged spells from afar he would not be able to deliver any lasting damage. The difference in levels was just too big, it didn't seem that they had any options left besides running. What are you all babbling about, are we doing this or not? A somewhat injured Grishalda appeared out of the blue and joined this team of five adventurers. She appeared by jumping forward and cleaving a tentacle in half before it reached them, showing off that she was above Orson's swordsmanship skills. Go die on your own you idiot, we need to run. I say we split in all directions, it can't follow all of us. Senna replied quickly while trying to convince everyone to a tactical retreat. However, this came a bit late as when everyone was about to back away a new set of wriggly things appeared behind them. There were many, Mook, H more than in front. Does it want to box us in? Roland said while scanning and looking in all directions. The same tendrils started appearing all around the area. It was as if they were in a prison cell made from squishy dark flesh that was slowly contracting towards them. The monster had more intelligence than he anticipated. While bashing the place from where it was standing it distracted the people while at the same time burrowing underground and forming an enclosure. Now they were trapped with it and the only way out would be to go through the rubbery things. Should I blast a hole through and run? There was only one way that he could think of at this short notice. If he used a strong enough spell he would probably be able to create a hole for some people to get through. A large number of the caravan participants would remain trapped as those tentacles would surely reform themselves quite fast but was there any other way for him to survive? Shit. He looked towards the ones that were screaming while unsure where to run and he started to move his hand into his sackel where he had his special jewels. Yet before he could pull one out he felt a large surge of magical energy. This energy was somewhat peculiar, it was certainly composed of mana but there was something else there something divine and it was quickly approaching the spot that the monster occupied. Chapter 216, Unexpected Ally The radiant arc of glistering yellow came from out of nowhere. It traveled at an astonishing speed and connected with a bunch of those rubbery tentacles. They were in the process of wrapping around some screaming caravan travelers but were cleanly severed by the thin arch of energy. Roland had witnessed similar techniques in his life and this seemed to be some kind of cutting skill. The bright golden color made it stick out from the rest as it mostly represented the divine or the holy element. Energy attacks like this took on the coloring of their respective element. When there was no element mana took on a pale blue color instead. Is that a woman? Did we have someone with us like that? Senna the halfling was the first one to point toward the person that produced this long-range attack. 
Just a moment ago running away was the only option but now there seemed to be someone on the level of this monster helping them out. To his surprise, he knew who this person was. It's the girl from the guild? The previously tied up har had been loosened and their color had changed into a bright yellow. Her hazel eyes had turned into a brighter tint of dark yellow as well. Yet the most eye-catching thing about her was the bright golden weapon that she was holding. From this location, it looked like a condensed beam of light but it wasn't quite that. Is that a concentrated orb blade? Name. Malena L68. Classes. T2 Analyst L18. T1 Accountant L25. T1 Villager L25. Before Roland made any speculations he activated his identification skill once more. There is before he only received mundane classes and stats. It was clear that the person there was not an analyst but possessed a higher tier battle class. Some kind of item was used to fool his analyzing skill and he didn't even notice that anything was wrong. If her name was actually Malena was also up to debate. For now, she looked like an alley but was she strong enough to defeat this malformed monster? In her right hand, she was holding a hilt of a sword. From the hilt, a bright golden radiant crystallization was shooting out. To the untrained eye, it might have looked like some kind of laser sword but it was not made from light. This was an advanced aura skill used by various classes possessing it. From what Roland had read it could materialize an insanely hard weapon. The most common was a sharp blade that could even slice through mithril depending on the person using it. Then there was the color which made it seem that this woman was related to the church and the words that she spoke confirmed this. Filthy creature of the abyss you will not take any more lives. This I swear on the name of Solaria. Her voice was stern, she did not sound like the ditzy untrained guild worker that he met before. It was now clear that this woman was good at acting the part of an inexperienced guild instructor but in reality, she was a somewhat battle-hardened member of the church. Is that woman part of the Solera church? Could she be from the Golden Order? Orson asked while standing to the side. While the ray of light sliced through the monster its attention shifted to the new foe and gave everyone here some time to think. The Golden Order? Grishalda asked without knowing what the human was talking about. You don't know who the Knights of the Golden Order are? You really are stupid, how did you survive this long? Replied the halfling while narrowing her eyes. Why you little? Stop it, now is not the time to argue that woman might be from the Golden Order but that doesn't mean that she can defeat that tier 3 monster alone. Roland was quick to interrupt the two idiots from having a fight in the middle of a life and death situation. While no one explained he already knew of this order of knights that belonged to the church. They were hand-picked by the church and acted as judges, juries, and executioners whenever the occult was involved. They were a small group of powerful individuals that possessed specialized skills and classes. If they wished they could rally troops belonging to the church and also to the nobles. The kingdom had a symbiotic relationship with its main religion thus lending aid to their strongest members was a given. Even within this knight order, there was a distinction between positions. The most influential members were the golden inquisitors that only answered to the pope. How far into their ranks this woman reached was unknown to him. Why she was here alone in the middle of nowhere was also a big question. Did she know that the abyssal cult was here? But wouldn't it be better to gather a large force to take them out instead of going in solo? She was also affected by the illusionary relic. Roland did not have enough information to figure out how this person ended up here. For all he knew she was undercover for a different reason and this was just a coincidence. But this worked in his favor as now the battle might not be hopeless. While the tentacles that surrounded the whole area still remained they didn't seem as active as before. The monster was focusing its attention on the woman that was able to wound it. The appendages that she had slipped through also seemed to be affected by the golden energy as they weren't regenerating at all. Finally, she charged forward, her foot hit the ground and created a small indenture. Her speed was truly tremendous, not even Roland who could boost his agility with his runic armor would be able to reach such speeds. However, the monster she was facing wasn't a slouch either. The multiple tendrils and tentacles shot out instantly while the monstrosity cried out with its many mouths. It was as if a hail of bullets was coming her way but she did not stop with her advance instead she just lowered herself to minimize any potential points of impact while also increasing her speed. While a normal person would have been instantly impaled and absorbed by the monster she was able to outpace it. The tendrils connected with the ground under her while she slipped past them. Yet she did not get past unscathed, some of them managed to graze her body. These monster attacks were shooting out in rapid succession. 
she did not manage to dodge them all as she sustained some grazing wounds. Even then she continued to get close all the way until she was in close quarters combat range. Why is she getting so close, could she be? Roland wasn't sure why Milena was rushing into danger this much. After showing off that ranged attack it made sense to keep distance and use it more often. It was capable of slicing through multiple tentacles at once and posed a real threat to the monster. That is if she could fire it off repeatedly. Is she tired or something? Not like she participated in the previous fight but wait. I don't recall seeing her in the temple. When thinking back to the temple ritual he didn't remember seeing the woman there. He focused mostly on the cultists and the people having the leeches inserted into them. There was a small pile of people that had already passed to the side which he did not examine as much. Could that be it? Is it still inside her head or did she get it out? He didn't really have the chance to check on the affected people yet. The cultists chased him down to the other side of the double helix. The woman might be having problems with brain slugs while fighting or had removed it at a cost. Would she be able to defeat the monster in her weakened state? After managing to force her way through the mass of tentacles she was now standing a few meters away from the large creature. Her sword finally shot out towards her enemy which protected its main body with a mass of squiggly things. Yet the sword still managed to plow through most of them along with injuring the monster's main body. The creature let out a massive howl while thrashing about. It seemed that the monster was on the ropes as the cage that it formed with its body was retracted. It was defending itself by calling back the appendages that it spread through the underground of this village. We must run away, now is our chance. Roland turned to the voice from afar that belonged to the guard captain that was somehow still alive. The caravan owner was also there in the moment the fleshy prison bars were gone they made a run for it while abandoning anyone else. Shouldn't we also go? I. Orson looked to Dalrak, the coast was clear and they could escape now. Even if the woman from the Golden Order didn't win they would be able to survive. It didn't seem that the monster could move that huge body that fast. If they got out of the range of its many tentacles they would be safe. The other remaining adventurers and travelers were already scattering to the sides. Some were going towards the surrounding woods while others went back to the wagons. The animals were going crazy but if handled right could still be used for a faster escape. That girl is going to die. Grishalda commented while looking. It seemed that she also noticed that the blonde was getting slower by the second. She was like a candle flame that burns the brightest before it dies. Perhaps she had an ace up her sleeve but from outside it looked like her stamina would run out faster than the monsters would. What are you talking about, you idiot? Even if she is going to die, what will you do? Seta asked while backing away. She was not willing to stay for much longer. This was the right choice as there was no way anyone here could intervene in a tier 3 battle. They were in separate worlds, they would only be turned to the monster's food and help it regenerate. I didn't say I would do anything, you twerp. Grishalda did the same, even though she was a strong barbarian there was nothing that S.H. he could do here either. It was better to live to fight another day, everyone seemed to be in agreement as they started to back away but one of them stepped forward. Wayland? Hey where are you going, that's where the squiggly monster is. Asked Senna along with the others as they saw Roland step forward while placing a gem into the small chest cavity on the front. Uh, go ahead I won't be far behind, I just need to do something first. While he realized that what he was about to do wasn't the smartest it was also a chance to gain an ally. If he just left and this knight here died he worried that the abyssal cult would just ransack this place. The creature was probably created to keep this place a secret and it would most likely destroy the relic that caused those illusions to happen. Roland was getting tired of running away. It never really solved any problems, just pushed them towards another date. The longer he didn't face reality the worse the future would be. He would not be surprised if the cool T.S.T.S. got a hold of the passenger list of this caravan and then started assassinating each one of them after this was over. How could he prevent this from happening? Either by running again and keeping a low profile for another couple of years or giving the cult other things to worry about. Their biggest secret was this cursed relic of theirs. Without it, they would not be able to carry out their assassinations. If he could help this woman defeat this monster then perhaps the cult's biggest asset would be exposed. While he had inserted the gem into his armor it was not as powerful as he had hoped for. To deliver a meaningful blow to the monster he needed to get closer. Luckily his enemy was preoccupied with the blonde church member. Her aura sword was turning the tentacles into mincemeat but the creature had many to spare. After feeding on some adventurer corpses it was managing to cope with that radiant blade of light. There he goes. 
The small group of adventurers looked at each other while Roland moved F forward. Even though none of them were willing to get closer to the monster they all still remained in close proximity wondering what their new friend was trying to achieve. After activating all of the cloaking spells that he had in his possession he slowly sank head towards the center of the battle area. The closer he got the more outlandish the battle seemed to him. He could barely see the blurry tentacles flying around yet the woman even in her weakened state was able to bat them away with the help of her swordsmanship. She did not seem to have any grand skills besides the ranged attack she performed a few times. It was swordsmanship and quick movement that she was relying on to keep herself going. Regretfully the decrease in speed was starting to be noticeable, even though the monster was getting cut she was unable to find the core to finish it off. This thing's weak point must be changing locations. If this monster was similar to a slime then it had some kind of core that if destroyed would cause it to die. But while slimes were transparent and their core was easy to spot, this thing was pitch black with many eyes, mouths, and tendrils. Finding its core in such a chaotic battle would be almost impossible. That's why burning through its body with magical energy could be the best choice. Hey I don't know who you really are but if you can hear me, dodge. Finally, he found his opportunity to strike. The same long range spell was activated, and the runes started burning into the metal yet again as they shifted from blue to red from being overloaded. His Goliath Slayer title was probably increasing his damage as the creature outleveled him by quite a bit. The monster was focusing on the front where the ore user was so he decided to aim right for its back. The wide drill light beam shot out yet again but now with even more mana behind it. After drinking some mana recovering potions he decided to go for broke. Previously he took his entire mana pool below 50% now he would push it further down. The energy arcs gained in thickness as they continued to destroy the ground he was standing around as he continued to pump out his spell. But to his surprise, a bunch of tentacles shot out just in time to protect the monster's body from behind. Yet he did not stop and as he continued to prolong the attack he drilled itself into those thick rubber-like appendages before breaking them. At about this point in time he lost his footing as the strain on his body had gotten too high and a splitting headache caused him to crumble to the ground. A resounding explosion rocked the entire area and it was quickly followed by another huge scream coming from the monster. It was hurt and part of its body evaporated yet again but instead of dying it continued to flail around those tentacles that were now on a collision course with the one injuring it. Before the monster's retaliation began though the person on the other side counterattacked as well. The moment that Roland gave her was enough, her sword moved at an astonishing speed to connect with the now exposed weakened spot. During the explosion, it had become apparent and now it had been cleaved in two by the golden blade made from Mora. Almost as if time had stopped, the tentacles halted their advance. Roland, who had stumbled down to one knee, looked up to see a pointy spear of dark flesh just a few centimeters away from his eyes. Soon it started crumbling into dust as if it was burned away by a massive fire. The moment the monster's core was destroyed its life was over, it could not even groan as it disintegrated before his eyes. The battle at the village finally reached its conclusion and the two responsible for it were looking at each other. One was an unsuspecting runesmith that didn't want to stand out and the other was a supposed guild worker that just came to grade a test. Chapter 217, The Aftermath Name Lorena L204 Classes T3 Divine Sword Master L54 T2 Radiant Sword Dancer L50 T2 Or Swordsman L50 T1 Blade Acolyte L25 T1 Sword Warrior L25 T He Monster was dead and the battle was over. The accountant by the name of Malena had managed to deliver the finishing blow while the monster was distracted by Roland's magical blast. Her clothes were in taters and revealed a body fit for a warrior with many muscles and scars. Yet this was not what Roland was looking at this point in time. His gaze was on the status screen of this woman that had been updated. Lorena was her true name and her classes were quite interesting. Probably the item that kept her status screen had been destroyed along with her clothes during the battle which allowed Roland to take a peek. Lorena had certainly been blessed with good swordsmanship, even her first class was a sword warrior. This class was usually taken by people trying to rank up into tier 2 swordsmen down the line. The blade acolyte was unknown to him but it indicated the relationship with the church. That was nothing new as during the battle the woman brought up her relation to the church a few times. The golden oral blade was also a dead giveaway that she was related to some kind of deity. The coloring would be dependent on the god they were involved in. The cultist for instance would probably have a more darkened blade either pitch black or dark purple. 
This battle also gave him a bunch of experience. He delivered two large blasts to the high-level tier 3 monster. Even without delivering the killing blow he was rewarded with three level ups and was fast approaching the tier 3 threshold. Name Roland Arden L129 Classes T2 Runesmith Lord L50, Secondary T2 Runic Engineer L4, Primary T1 Mage L25, Tertiary T1 Runic Monoscribe L25, X T1 Runic Blacksmith L25, X HP 5272 6252 MP 4418 15333 SP 7643 9155 Strength 164 Agility 130 Dexterity 202 Vitality 169 Endurance 181. Intelligence. 236. Willpower. 217. Charisma. 18. Luck. 11. Besides getting some new stats his dexterity was pushed past 200 which gave him another trait. It seemed that he would not need to worry about fumble Ing when working with his hands even less. Dexterous eye increases the nimbleness of a person's hands allowing them to perform tasks faster and with grace. While his old runesmith lord class was more equalized in all fields his new runic engineer seemed to put strength and agility into the back burner. This was fine as he could bridge the gap with the help of his armor, the more mana and intelligence he possessed the more his spells would scale of them. No new skills were unlocked which was normal. Usually, new skills would be unlocked every 10 levels or so, sometimes it was even rarer. Nothing was a guarantee and some classes required the person to unlock the skill themselves by some kind of revelation. A skill book was the best way but an individual could acquire a skill on their own accord if they managed to figure something out. It was similar to gaining a climbing skill just by going up a tree a few times. You have my gratitude. I didn't do much, just distracted it for a moment. While glancing between the interface he saw that the woman from the church regained her footing. Even now her breathing was erratic and the glistering aura blade had crumbled into dust with only a sword hilt remaining in place. He had to give it to this weapon. It was quite fascinating and compact. Could he create a magical version of it that would not consume all of his mana at once? An oral blade was considered to be equal to something like mithril. While this was not the strongest metal out there it was from the top shelf. Yet it would still be damaged while a blade made from mora could be recreated multiple times. A sword hilt wasn't even needed, if a person's oral blade skill was high enough they could even create it from thin air. Yet the more space it covered the more resources it burned up. A hilt was not as important as most master swordsmen used separate items made from similar alloys. The one this woman was using looked to be high quality with various gems placed on the sides that perhaps augmented the blade in some way. Don't sell yourself short Mr. Wayland, you were able to cause damage to an abyssal creature you will have my eternal gratitude. The woman did something surprising as she bowed her head before someone of a lower level. This caught him off guard as most people with power would most likely brush his involvement to the side. Yet now came another problem, what was this all about? What started as a regular rank-up test for a silver-grade adventurer turned into a cult eradication mission? Don't worry about it, more importantly, Ms. Malena. Are you feeling alright? I saw what those cultists did to the people, your eye. Roland could see the woman's legs shaking, even though she was standing up there were many wounds on her body. Then there was also her left eye which seemed to have been occupied by one of those tiny leech-like monsters. While he seemed concerned about the woman's wounds in reality he was somewhat prodding for answers. If she was from the church she probably knew what this was all about, perhaps he could finally figure out what this abyssal cult was after. I am immune to the abyssal influence. But what did you just say? You saw the cultists perform their dark ritual, could you explain yourself? The woman seemed to react strangely to his question. After thinking for a moment he realized the mistake he made. I, well. Lorena was part of the church and was here probably to hunt down the abyssal cultists. This meant that she should be somewhat aware of how they conducted themselves. Roland did not know if the church actually knew about the runic items they were using to evade detection. Considering that this high-level tier 3 swordmaster had a strange creature inserted into her eye socket, they probably didn't. This made his involvement in the cult peculiar, perhaps it made him look like an accomplice. 
The information about the cult was really vague but if someone knew something it would be this knight from the church. That's what I would like to know, weren't you already fighting? Gee these bastards when we were in that smelly temple? Seno peered out of the blue between the two, right behind her Orson and Dalarak were already arriving with a somewhat mean looking barbarian. That's true, it took some time to awaken you from that illusion. Illusion? Yes, you probably remember coming to this village and experiencing many various events, I'm sure if you ask the others they will give you a different recount of their experiences. Lorena started nodding while listening to Roland, while his innocence was probably not proven he could quickly clear up the misunderstanding. What he needed now were allies that would help him against the Abyssal Cult. What better way to keep them off his back than sending another large force their way? If I give this woman enough information then perhaps the church could take care of the cult for me. Can you see that large double helix-like tower? Hey! Wasn't there a large tree inside the village instead, how did that thing get here? Senna replied while looking at the ominous-looking thing. All of them saw the initial village scenario with the dancing women and festivities before their own imagination and cravings took over. The large tree was the center of the illusory world and without accessing the core rune or destroying it there was no way out. Without his debugging skill that showed him the runic structures, it would be impossible for even him that was already a skillful high-level runesmith. That's the symbol of the Abyssal Cult, it represents the evil god's twin tongue and you say that it was responsible. Lorena commented while looking at the tower in the distance. While he wanted to ask her a few things, there was a barrier of levels between them. The woman was tired but she would probably be able to take care of all of them in a flash. While he was fine giving her some information, it would be better to get something in return without getting forced to go present a lecture to the church. So it's this evil relic, you must tell me what you know about it. Soon the woman stepped toward Roland while putting the sword hilt to the side. Yet she didn't seem to be in quite the condition that he expected. The moment that first step was taken she tumbled forward and fell onto her face. The display was quite comedic as right after getting a bloody nose she quickly got back up. Her face was emotionless as if she was trying to make everyone ignore what had happened and it worked. How about we mend our wounds first? Roland proposed while looking around. About a quarter of the caravan travelers had been killed by the monster and cultist. Then another quarter had fled in all directions during and after the monster was killed. The merchant owner was nowhere to be seen and there were still many injured people everywhere. Are there more of those bastards around? Should we make a run for it before more of them appear? Orson asked while Roland quickly replied. That's a possibility. There won't be any more coming. Lorena shot down the ends. They're quite fast and explained even quicker. They only summon that monstrosity if they wish to cleanse the area. They would not have done it if any meaningful support was coming. So that thing was supposed to destroy the whole area along with us? Lorena nodded while stumbling forward and rubbing her head. It seemed that she was dead set on getting information out of him but at her current state even he would be able to make a run for it. There was no reason though, she didn't seem as much of a zealot as the other church members. Hey Blondie, get a grip of yourself you did enough, what good will it do if you pass out? Surprisingly Grishalda was the first one to walk over to the swordmaster and give her a shoulder to rest on. You have my gratitude. The two women looked at each other and it seemed that the divine swordmaster took up the offer. Soon enough they all headed towards the caravan where people were gathering. After the monster was dead all of the tentacles turned to dark sludge that start D to quickly evaporate. It was as if the cultists were never there to begin with. Everyone gathered around the remaining wagons where they had their supplies and healing items. Some of the merchants had escaped, this included the main one that took off with the cart Roland once occupied. Regretfully there was no priest among them and Lorena was poised for combat. This left potions and other healing items to mend the various wounds that were sustained during combat. The monster didn't manage to instantly kill everyone, some were missing limbs or had their body drained of most vitality while still surviving. In their current state, they could very well die before reaching the next destination. Then there were also the people affected by the strange parasites. After a small break, Roland and some of the other adventurers decided to go back to the temple. These infected people were all still asleep even when the runic items stopped sending out signals. The only person that could help them now was the church me. Remember that seemed to know a thing or two about these cultists. So, it's not an occult relic but a runic one? Yes, it seems to be sending out signals via sound waves that affect anyone that gets within range. At first I thought that it was by sight but after examining the control device I realized that it wasn't. 
While they were moving the people out of the temple Roland started talking. He disclosed some of the information about the large tower. How he found the core rune inside the illusion he did not mention but most of the things he told her was the truth. The medallion that he took from the Dark Priests he also handed to the Golden Order member that soon confirmed her identity. You can call me Lorena, as you might have realized I am a member of the church. I must thank you for your continued assistance. With this much information, we might finally be able to put a stop to these evil heretics. That they would use illusion magic by way of sound and that it would even affect me, this was truly a blue and dare. Ms. Lorena, I have told you about the runic item and the way of interfacing with it but could you enlighten me about something? Yes? What were you doing here and will I be able to pass my gold rank test? Gold rank test? She stopped in her tracks while looking at the armored man that delivered the sentence in a monotone voice. Soon to Roland's surprise, she gave out a resounding laugh that was heard by almost everyone in the vicinity. Ha ha ha, that someone would worry about a gold rank test in a situation like this. Very well Mr. Whalen let me tell you a bit about my mission. It was not a coincidence that I found myself here, this area has reeked of abyssal decay. You have seen those little creatures, they call them rift larvas. Rift larva? Yes, that I would have the joy of being infected by one. Worry not, we of the Golden Order are blessed by the goddess, such an evil creature will be burned away with time. This instantly explained how the woman was able to awaken while everyone else was still in deep slumber. We must get these people to the church before the curse spreads further. They continued with their task at hand while Lorena spoke about her secret mission. While she kept it vague and left out any names he continued to fill in the gaps himself. Some way or another she had received a tip about the activity of the cult here. She had clearly worked together with the Adventurer Guild to get the position of an instructor. Her disguise was quite intricate as even the cultists didn't discover her true identity. The larva would have burned away eventually, perhaps she might have been able to free herself from the illusion before they were sent back to the city. Can I ask you something? Yes, Mr. Wayland? What do these cultists hope to achieve by putting those rift larvae into people? That is sensitive information that I can't disclose, I hope you understand. Roland nodded while not being offended. He was still only an outsider that was not part of the church. Perhaps as he had saved this Golden Order member here today but it didn't mean that he was owed an explanation. There was already enough that he knew, with this much he could make his own theory that was probably not far from the real truth. Shit, does this mean that we won't be paid? After the long talk about the cultists was finished everyone gathered at the caravan area. Senna was stomping on some dirt while shouting. With the disappearance of the merchant leader, their reward for the transport mission was debatable. That merchant probably went towards his initial destination, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes straight to the guild or the ruling noble when he arrives there. Some of the wagons were missing but a lot of merchandise was still here. The merchant had made it out with his life and was probably going to try and get his wares back. It would have been surprising to Roland if they ran into a rescue party being formed in the next city they would visit. If we take these wagons to the guild they shoo. LD take care of it, the merchant will have to pay one way or another. Dalrak chimed in as he knew the usual procedures. If the merchants didn't pay up then their items could be confiscated as collateral. The guild would then just sell everything off and if it was enough give the adventurers their full salaries back. I hope you are right. So does that mean I can drink all of the booze? There is a lot of it here. Orson called out from the back while holding a bottle of wine. He had rescued two bottles from one of the carts and was already drinking. The second bottle was tossed towards Grishalda that just smirked. Ha, huh, we can just tell them that they were already empty when we got here. Soon enough all of the adventurers started shouting out and raiding the liquor-filled wagon. Roland just shook his head but was fine with it, everyone was tired. What they needed was some rest and relaxation before journeying towards the original city. Chapter 218, Time to Go Back. Here. Thank you, so, you are really going to stay behind? Yes, this runic tower will help us against the evil heretics. I must thank you for lending me your runic expertise. Is that so? Roland bowed before the golden-haired woman that was now looking a lot better. She was not a tier 3 class holder for nothing as within half a day she had recovered all of her lost health and stamina. They had remained in the village until the next day. There were many injured people which required them to use up all of their healing potions that still remained. Luckily the next city wasn't far away and the lands were now protected by the Valyrian noble house. Running into bandits would be even less likely than having another cultist encounter. 
During this time he had explained about the strange runic device as much as he could. He implied that it was due to his rune-related class that he was able to awaken from the strange illusory world. To his surprise, this was enough to get Lorena's approval. It seemed that she was somewhat able to discover the fake village. Yet without any way of finding the core rune she was unable to free herself. Instead, she activated the defense mechanism and found herself being attacked by strange monstrosities. Only after Roland managed to disable the tower signals was she able to awaken. Will this letter be enough? Roland looked at a sealed letter that Lorena had written up for him. Due to her secret mission, she needed to remain here. This brought a problem to the table as he still wanted to pass his gold rank quest. If the person that he was required to escort didn't arrive at the city then he would certainly fail. However, Lorena was thankful enough to write him up a letter that he was supposed to pass to the guild master of Rika, the city that was his last stop. Yes, if you mention my name and give him this then everything will be taken care of. Thank you and as we discussed before. You're a strange one Wayland, anyone else would be honored to be rewarded by the church your role in this in. Sidon was not mine or are you sure you don't wish to reconsider? Yes, that would be best. It would be better if the cult didn't know that I was involved in this affair. This was the only thing that he asked her for. She would be taking credit for everything while he would be left anonymous. He believed that the cult could get their hands on the official report which would point them straight to his workshop. As you wish then, I will keep this between you and I, but know this. I will be forever grateful for your help. He nodded while slipping the letter into his spatial bag. While he and all the others would be leaving this one woman would remain here. A few hours ago he saw her use a similar letter transportation spell as the cat professor from the Magic Academy. There were several blue swallows flying in all directions. In their previous conversation, he implied that runic mages along with runesmiths would be indispensable in examining this relic. He himself wanted to go at it but his skill with Thai R3 runes wasn't quite there yet. In spite of that Roland was not going away empty-handed. With the help of his debugging skill, he had copied over the schematic of the control medallion that was now in Marina's possession. With so many attempts at copying schematics from stores, he had gotten the hang of it now. Both this and the relic's main schematic was noted down but the more important part was the inside runic structure. This he did not really have the time to research and copy from the larger relic. The only item he would be comfortable in decoding was the medallion that worked like a remote control. This was already a big step in the right direction as it could help him design countermeasures against that signal the main runic item sent. From what he could deduct the initial spell was activated by sound. Yet the possibility of a combination of sight and sound could not be excluded yet. The pulsating signal was there and it might be enough to block it to be protected from being caught in the illu cyan. I must also thank you for pointing me towards a worthwhile expert, that someone with connections to the Magic Academy like you was here, is truly a blessing from the goddess. Ah yes, that person should be able to decipher the runic structure if you manage to get them here. Roland decided to go with a little gamble. He was not able to get through the complex marriage spell that was implanted into this double helix. There were high-tier runic mages that were more experienced than him and one of them was his mentor. Thus if Lorena managed to yank the cat over here to do some research, he might be able to get the information from him later. Phew, for a moment I thought that she would force me to stay behind and help her decipher everything here. As he walked away his pace started to increase. The woman he interacted with could probably slice off his head in one move if she deemed him to be some cult member. Luckily after helping her with the strange tentacle monster he had gained her trust. We let he was able to survive this second encounter with the abyssal cult it was yet again thanks to another person. Without Lorena appearing out of the blue he would either be dead by now or running for his life through the forest like the other escapees. His armor was able to pierce through a high level tier 3 monster but it would only work on an immobile enemy. It was not something he could repeatedly use against a fast moving enemy or one that could regenerate themselves like this one. Then there was also the problem of his armor's runes degrading from overloading and being empowered. After two shots some of them had already degraded from the highest rating into the intermediate one. Without the ability to quickly mend them, they would have probably not been able to function past the second blast. Should I focus on immobilizing my enemies or a more sustainable form of combat? Roland was not a battle expert and was limited to mostly encountering monsters in the dungeon. He had the basics down thanks to being trained at the noble household during his childhood. Yet even with a quick wit and battle awareness, there was no possibility of combating people with monstrous skills. During the battle, thanks to his parallel thinking skill, 
he could keep up with some of the monster's movements. Yet even if his mind could keep up that was not the same for his body. It took some time to inject mana into the armor to boost his stats and then react. Only by boosting himself with various spells was he even able to see part of Lorena's sword movements. He did not feel like he would last more than a few seconds during an exchange with that woman. The gap between him and a tier 3 class holder might have gotten a bit smaller but he was nowhere near strong enough to win a proper one-on-one -on -one duel. The only way he could see himself winning was by luring his opponent into a drawn-out battle where he utilized golems, ranged spells, and explosives. His weapons were able to pierce through the monster's body but this monster was specialized in regenerating itself. Its body was not heavily armored yet still proved troublesome for the high-level tier 2 adventurers. The monsters varied in shape and specialization and depending on it he would need to alter his tactics. Are you finished with telling your girlfriend your goodbyes? Yeah, we are finished, we can leave now. Will you're no fun. Senna's attempt at teasing Roland had failed as he just ignored her comments. He had spent quite some time explaining the runic device while trying to squeeze some information about the cult from Lorena. To his dismay, she was unwilling to give out much besides some of their structure that he had witnessed here. While going up onto the new wagon which he now occupied with Dalrak, Orson and Senna he started thinking back to it. The Abyssal cult worshipped a prominent evil god that supposedly lived in some kind of void dimension. The thing they worshipped had no gender nor did it have a set physical form like other gods similar to Solaria. There, he was one thing that everyone agreed on, the creature had some kind of double helix protrusion coming out from its body that the cultists turned into their calling card. Lorena told him that the creature that they thought was corrupted by the Void God's divinity. The corruption would rob the corrupted of their will and turn them into a creature with a desire that originated before the transformation. The monster's form was something that was supposed to resemble its master. It was the same for the Abyssal Warlocks, he had seen one of them before and the tentacles along with growing more eyes was a similar trait they shared. His new acquaintance didn't go into much detail but it seemed that those tier 3 warlocks would be around the level of the Golden Order Knights she was a part of. She did not mention the goal of this cult nor what the brain parasites were for. The evil gods and monsters from other dimensions had various strange motives but mostly it was a battle for believers. Perhaps the larva were th air to alter the brain and turn anyone into another abyssal worshipper? Or perhaps they would turn them into mindless monsters to bolster their forces. Roland did not prod further as the reason was not that important. Even without knowing it, he knew that the cult had to be stopped. People with these larvae in their heads would not be aware of their existence. This was truly a terrifying thing to realize, anyone he knew could be infected. The only way of curing those little pests was through divine energy that was in possession of high-level priests. Yet without realizing that the process of contamination took place, no one would seek out a priest to have this cursed creature removed. It would fester in their head for God knows how long perhaps waiting for the right time to take the host over. Fortunately, he had witnessed the removal of these little monsters by the hand of the Divine Swordmaster. The procedure was a lot easier than he expected as even without a proper healing spell it could be done. Lori not just needed to use her Divine Aura Blade that radiated holy energies. After holding it close to the afflicted area the larva would deteriorate. It was truly not for the faint of heart. During the procedure, the larva would panic and crawl outside through one of the host's orifices. This would either be the nose, the ears, or back through the eye socket. By this time it would have shrunk from the 5 cm size down by a half and then directly turn into a puff of smoke. It should be enough to go to the priest and tell them to focus their energies on the head. After witnessing this spectacle he had made up his mind to get a checkup. While he didn't think that this was such a prevalent affliction he could never know. This expedition showed him that no one was safe. Some of his acquaintances like Armand and Lobelia left the city regularly. They could have gone through this area on their travels and been infested by abyssal parasites. What do you think will happen to those people? I don't know, just leave it to the church. As they were slowly moving away from the village, Senna posed a question to Orson that just shrugged. Even though they had removed the abyssal larvae from the inflicted they had stayed behind in the village. Lorena told them that the people that were directly affected by the abyssal corruption needed to be further inspected. It was actually surprising that she just allowed all of the rest to leave. It didn't seem that she was trying to hide that the incident took place like some other people in power would. He could not imagine the Valyrian household allowing this info to leave the village if they could stop it. It would make them look bad that they allowed the evil cultists to occupy one of the villages in their main territory. I guess the church doesn't care? Or is this woman just a peculiar case? 
After spending many years in this new world he had gained some insight into how the people in power operated. Mostly they would withhold any kind of disturbing information like this and try sweeping everything under the rug. Even when corrupt nobles were discovered everything was done to keep the information from spreading. They wanted to keep the commoners feeling content with their power structure, if it seemed that the rulers were incompetent then a revolt was more likely. Lorena was a peculiar case then, even when being part of something called the Golden Order she didn't feel like a proper knight. Her class distribution made her look like an adventurer as usual someone at her position would have a paladin class instead. People with those classes were usually a lot more fanatic about their belief in God. How she handled the infected was also quite mild. From his research concerning the wars between the cultists and the church zealots, the results were mostly more bloody. The paladins usually went to more extreme lengths of erasing anyone with potential ties to evil gods. It didn't seem that he was the only one thinking this as his travel companion started to speak up. I, that girlie scared me for a moment, though she would have taken that last head. Darlock spoke up after their smaller caravan had finally left the village and they were on their way. Yeah, when she pulled out that glowing sword I thought she would slaughter them all. Yeah, that was strange. Was she really from the Golden Order? Heard those guys aren't much different from the cultists. The denizens of this world confirmed his thoughts as it was more likely for a high-tier church member to burn the village down along with the afflicted than to help them out directly. Yet she still had them stay behind, if those people survived when the rest of the inquisitors arrived at the palace was up to debate. You don't think that she just sent us away so that her church allies can ambush us in the woods? You all saw that woman use that communication spell. After speaking about religious cleansing Senna started looking nervous. It seemed to have gotten the attention of the others that quickly grabbed their wee apons to protect themselves. Why would she do that? Not like she wouldn't be able to kill us in the village by herself. Roland commented while not believing the conspiracy theory yet but the others weren't convinced. She wouldn't be able to get us all but if there is a larger force surrounding us then perhaps. Senna replied while somewhat making some sense. There were a lot of survivors in the village and Lorena might not have been able to kill everyone if they spread out into the forest. There were others that escaped before we even left, at this point what can they do? Stop making stuff up you idiots. Grishalda called out from the top of the cart all of them were now on. A part of the adventurers along with the merchant owner had already escaped before the monster was slain. Even if the church killed them all now the information would already leave this place. Luckily the kill would be attributed to the Golden Order member and not to the wandering rune mage that was along for the ride. He had Ga and a good shield to shift blame onto but if his new acquaintance would be able to keep his involvement hidden was unknown to him. One thing he was convinced of though, the woman sounded genuine in her words so he was not expecting any paladins to cleanse this smaller caravan. Thus while his adventure companions continued to stress out about it he just leaned back and already thought about what he could do when he returned home. Chapter 219 not over yet? What is that, is this some foreign language? Those are some strange symbols and drawings, is it magic? Could you stop doing that? But it's so boring. A bored halfling gave out a sigh while looking over the shoulder of a certain armored man who was scribbling something into a notebook. Leave Wayland alone, Senna, we will be there in a few hours. After Senna was shooed away by her party member Orson Roland was able to go back to his notes. These were the ones he took during his stay at the village taken over by the abyssal cultists. It described in detail the way the tier 2 ranked remote device worked along with its runic program. Luckily Roland was well versed in the ways of copying runes. During his stay in the village, he had used those skills to copy over the medallion's runic structure onto a piece of similarly shaped metal. Thanks to this he would be able to slowly analyze the inner workings later even if he didn't fully go through the code yet. The larger problem was the higher tier main relic that was used to create the illusion. It could pierce through high amounts of willpower and even affect someone that had divine skills like the sword master. Yet that woman had mostly combat focused classes so she might have not built up any mental defenses against attacks like that. He could not leave that option out, perhaps some tier 3 classes would be immune to the effect of that magical device if they had some specialized skills. His armor and runic spells that he applied to it were clearly not enough and he would probably need to replace them with tier 3 variants to have a chance. But that's only if I can't figure out how this relic works, what are my options here? There wasn't much to do during the trip to the city of Rika. There had been no ambush as some of the other adventurers speculated and the whole journey was mostly boring. After a while, they found the main road and now could see vast farmlands which indicated that they were close to civilization. 
The volcanic earth here was high in nutrients for the plants and also gave them a red tint due to fire element influence. Thus while looking at the fields he continued to ponder the problem. The easiest way he could think of would be to insert some kind of kill switch into his armor. If placed at a timer it could send out a signal to any potential abyssal cult relics. Yet that would only work if these devices were copies of each other with no variation. There were various ways a runic craftsman could go around implementing safety measures into his items. One of them would be e to make them unique in some way, a slight variation to the code could alter the turn-off switch. This of course depended on the craftsmen and their willingness to alter their design. Would the person that created these double helix towers do that? Was he the conscious type or did he just copy everything to cut on time? Altering a tier 3 runic structure was not easy, changing something in the code could potentially cause the device to malfunction. By the way these cultists acted, their belief in that illusion was absolute. He thought to the two lazy guards that he easily killed after waking up. They were clearly not paying attention to his slumbering body. Either they were just lunatics enamored with their magical items or no one had given them a reason to doubt them. Perhaps the one time he managed to break through back an Adel guard was a first for them as well. Luckily for him, his tier 1 status probably shifted their suspicion towards the tier 3 class holder that was there instead. He wouldn't be surprised if his old gnome boss took the brunt of their revenge afterward, if he was still alive until now was also debatable. It was not a far-fetched idea if he considered the cult's ways. The higher the level the craftsman was the more conceited and hard-headed they got. Roland could see the person making these relics think they were infallible so they might have not bothered to change the perfect runic code they made. If they created the copies while believing that no one would be able to get their hands on the control medallions, then it would be feasible for him to create a countermeasure. He would only need to have his armor send out a signal to turn these runic relics off. This he could either do by making it do it constantly on a loop or make it react to the frequency the double helix was sending out. The second option was the more difficult solution as he would need to get to the bottom of the tier 3 runic operating system. For the current him this was not possible as he lacked the skills to access S tier 3 runes. Even if he had gone through a lot of theories he had no practice, the only person that could help him now was his acquaintance from the Magic Academy. I'm still not sure if Lorena will involve that cat. His involvement in the cult relic was already known by this church member so he made a shot in the dark by proposing a rune mage that he knew. He could only wait a bit to see if they ever contacted them for help or if they used their own people to investigate. Runic mages were few far and in between so the cat's involvement was not out of the question. To be on the safe side. Roland moved his hand into the satchel that had survived the ordeal. Inside of it, he had a few small things along with a certain magical scroll. Onto it. He started quickly scribbling a detailed recount of the incident with leaving out a few things he wished to keep secret. After he was finished he inserted his mana into a thumb-sized stamp on the side which caused the scroll to roll itself up while quickly turning into a green swallow afterward. Whoa. Grishalda shouted out as she saw a small bird made from wind mana bolt into the sky. It carried a letter to Roland's runic teacher with some information about the relic. Even if the cat professor wasn't asked for help he might know the person that was. Due to the lack of runic mages in the kingdom, a lot of them knew each other and exchanged research, it was not outlandish to believe that it was the same situation here. What are you surprised about, haven't you seen magic before or something? That's why country bumpkins like you are. Are what you little shit? I dare you to finish that sentence. As always the two women adventurers got under each other's skin. This was not the first time and actually something that the other adventurers started cheering on. But the joy was short-lived as soon Senna squinted with her eyes and called out. Hey it looks like we are going to have visitors, there are a lot of them and they are heavily armored. Without trees and tea, he way, his radar lost out to scout classes and their enhanced eyes. Yet even he could use similar ways to see further beyond. After peeking out from his cart, the visor he was using momentarily glowed in a blue light that caused the scenery to zoom into the distance. It looks like a group of mounted knights by the armor. Is that the Valyrian crest? Nobles, this could be bad. What do we do? Senna called out to the people on the other wagons and to some that were walking on foot but in reality, her words were aimed toward one person. This person put away the notebook he was working on somewhat surprised that he was being asked the question. What can we do? Just keep your head down. Everyone nodded at Roland's words as they knew that they could not go against soldiers from the Valyrian household. Even if there were no nobles or proper knights with them a commoner could not go against the ruling noble faction or their soldiers. 
Soon enough the now smaller caravan was forced to stop as it met with a foe. Or said about 30 mounted knights and various other mercenaries behind them. Halt, identify yourselves, who is in charge here? A man on horseback that was wearing the shiniest armor stepped forward while everyone waited. While he shouted the knights slowly started surrounding the carriages. There had to be some kind of order singling caravans like this out as normally soldiers would not have bothered and just passed by them. Answer me. Explain yourselves. The man shouted again as there didn't seem to be anyone willing to speak up. To Roland's surprise when he looked to the people he was with, they continued to stare at him and between the soldiers. Wait. Am I the one in charge here? It took a second for him to realize what was happening. It wasn't strange that after the village incident he was considered to be the strongest fighter here. Even Grishalda that was easy to anger was just sitting there and not doing anything. Without the merchant and his guards, it was up to the next in line to lead this small group of people. If you don't want to talk then. Wait. Before the armored man could continue Roland finally decided to speak up. His armored self was hidden in the back of the forward wagon and only became visible to the soldiers after he walked forward. Before I answer. Have you perhaps been tasked with securing the lost caravan going towards Rika? The owner goes by the name of Remond. After Roland gave some information about the caravan and the name of its owner it garnered a reaction. The leader looked to one of the knights that nodded his head before the conversation continued. Are you insinuating that you are from that caravan? Yes, as you can see, the wagons carry Mr. Remond's insignia with them. Merchants simulated noble houses by applying their own calling signs to their possessions. While they had no last name they would sometimes use their own and apply it to their wagons. The same applied here and if these knights were called here by the real owner then they were info. Rumed about this fact. The old man had to have made it to the city with his guards at least half a day before they got here. It seemed that the one in charge of the city had assembled the task force to get to the bottom of this incident. In the front, there was a group of armored knights but there were also various others like adventurers following behind them. You seem to speak the truth. While he was thinking about this predicament the armored men continued to encircle them. Roland didn't like this as they were quickly cutting off any escape routes that they could take. Not like he was inclined to charge at the soldiers belonging to a noble house, if he did even his noble roots might not help him. Is there a problem? He called out while everyone else also started getting concerned. Some of them like Grishalda were moving their hands towards their weapons. You will come with us, you are all under arrest, don't try to resist. I thought so. Roland could only sigh while looking at the shackles some of the other soldiers were pulling out. Even though they informed the other party about the truth they were only carrying out orders. This was probably the right decision from the leader's standpoint. He had no way of knowing if the people here were telling the truth or if they were bandits in disguise. They were tasked with rescuing people from the village but instead, they suddenly showed up on their doorstep. We won't. Wayland, what are you doing? Roland just looked towards the people behind him that for some reason picked him up to be the leader. Do you want to run and live as a bandit or something? Just go along with it, if that merchant was really the one behind this rescue mission then we won't spend that much time in the dungeon. His explanation had some merit so the other adventurers quickly agreed. Not like they could start a full-fledged battle with the people here, they would be turned into outcasts otherwise. They are going to take my armor though. This worried Roland as the men why T. H. Shackles approached he believed that they would confiscate all of his items which included the armor. Without it his battle power was seriously diminished and he would fare badly in a scuffle with a tier 2 class holder with a proper battle profession. However just as he was about to get shackled the ground began shaking. What is that? It was not an earthquake or any magical attack, no it was generated by horses. From behind another group of mounted riders quickly showed up as if they were following behind these soldiers. They were wearing very characteristic white armor with a red pattern depicting the sun. Are those Salarian knights? Are they being led by a paladin from the Golden Order? The soldiers halted in their advance as another force appeared out of nowhere. In the front, there was a magnificent looking knight wearing golden armor. Without needing to think much he realized what was happening. The backup forces that Lorena had called for had arrived and were charging towards the village Khan. Taining the abyssal relic. What's happening? Are you sure that we shouldn't run? asked Senna while looking out into the distance at the large group of armored church knights. Their forces were double of the one surrounding them. With how spooked everyone was after hearing about the church cleansing, some wanted to quickly run towards the hills. But unfortunately, they were surrounded and nothing but flatlands were here.
they would certainly not run far even if they wanted. Run where? Just remain calm. He replied while looking towards the wagon, the large horse that was pulling it could be used for a getaway. But not many people would fit on it and he was still unsure about his safety. Would these church people turn out to be zealots and try to take them away? If he had to choose he would rather go with the city soldiers as how the church operated was somewhat a mystery. They could be charged with some occult dealings and burned at the stake which he would like to avoid. Soon they arrived and just hey, as the soldiers did before them they started to encircle the whole caravan. They were now surrounded by two separate forces that were in a staring match with each other. Without being able to affect this situation he decided to listen in as his fate would probably be decided within the first few moments of the conversation between the leaders. We are from the Valerian household, noble paladins from the Solaria church. Could you explain your actions? The leader of the city soldiers stepped forward while remaining on his horse. He was being somewhat cordial with the larger force that also carried a lot of weight behind them. The duke's house was very prestigious but if someone could go against them it would be these religious forces that worked under a different set of rules. The person in the golden armor moved forward as well. Roland had to give it to the craftsman that created this magnificent plate mail. It was made from a superior metal and had many enchantments on it. Magical energy was radiating from it that could be felt by him. The item probably had various enhancements on it that reached tier 3. This armored man slowly removed their helmet and held onto his side. This gesture revealed the mature man beneath, he had a full set of salt and pepper hair along with a long beard matching it. His face was devoid of any scars but the sharp and experienced look informed everyone about this man's battle-hardened past. Yet when asked by the soldier leader about their motives the man did not reply, instead he looked in Roland's direction before speaking out. You fit the description. Everyone instantly looked at the man wearing the shiny runic armor that was now being stared at by a tier 3 or higher paladin. What this Golden Order paladin wanted from the adventurer was on everyone's mind and while they pondered the young man in question slowly realized what he was in for. Chapter 220, Nobody Expects the Solarian Inquisition. It was me? If they were in a cartoon then a large question mark vow, LD appear above Roland's head. The old man had a similar frame to his father but was slightly shorter. Was devoid of scarring but there was a certain thing in his eyes that made him seem like a battle-hardened warrior that had made it through many battles with monsters and humans alike. There was a clear difference in levels between them which Roland was unable to check with his analyzing skill. It was clear that just like the woman he met in the village he probably had an item that kept his status hidden away. Wait, did Lorena mention me to this person? This was the only answer he could come up with. The high-level paladin singled him out almost instantly as if he knew him. Probably the magical letters that she sent out had reached his hand. The question was what was in those letters, did she put in a good word for him, or was he about to get captured by the church instead? Young man, you are the one called Wayland are you not? While Roland's mind was racing to comprehend this man's motives the P. Aladdin arrived right before him. The soldiers from the city seemed offended but after taking one look at the man they backed away. This was obviously an inquisitor-level threat to them, no one besides a proper noble would be able to go against them. In this world of fantasy and magic, evil sorcerers, witches, and evil cults were quite real. It was up to the holy knights and priests to put an end to their dastardly deeds. Witches that performed evil curses were hunted down, evil cults were eradicated and anyone willing to aid them followed a similar fate. If an inquisitor found a person in cahoots with someone deemed a heretic then this person's life was forfeit. Even the soldiers here knew that with one word the paladin could turn their world into hell. That's right, I'm Wayland. Without having much choice he replied, the man's presence was truly tremendous. If he compared it to the creature he recently faced and the tier 3 woman he met then this person's presence was vastly superior. It was as if a large e predator was glaring at him ready to bite his head off and he had no way of escaping. Remove your helmet. You want me to remove my helmet? Yes. If Roland was apprehensive about one thing was removing his helmet and showing his face to people that he did not know. Many years had passed since the old incident with his family but this trait still was with him. He was slowly working on it yet even in the city he lived in he mostly covered his face partially by a hood. How dare you make the Inquisitor repeat himself? His character flaw of not seeing people above him differently made him cause a scene. One of the shiny white knights that was with this old man didn't appreciate the lowly uncultured adventurer's response. Roland could even see the man move his hand towards his sword ready to strike him down. 
Luckily the old man that was now revealed to be an actual inquisitor raised his hand which caused the knight to stop shouting and to back off. This was probably his chance to show some respect th. Us he begrudgingly decided to go ahead with the request. There was no way of running away and if a scary inquisitor was asking for something it was probably better to capitulate. Hmm? The old man's eyes met with Roland's almost instantly he thought that he was looking at some kind of beast. This was a difficult sensation to describe but even without his analyzing skill, he could feel that the gap between him and the old man here was vast as an ocean. He had felt a similar way a few times in his life, once when he met the tier 3 cult members that almost killed him or when encountering the tier 3 ant queen. Could this person be above tier 3? The man's eyes glowed with a golden sheen which caused his spine to tingle. His knees started to shake and he felt like dropping down to his knees. Yet after taking one step back he managed to catch himself to power through it. Tier 3 was the barrier that Roland was attempting to cross. This was one of the reasons that he had tossed himself into this short adventure. E to rank up. While not by much, having a higher adventurer rank would aid him in this goal. It was considered to be the first step into becoming an elite in this world and enough strength to walk with a head held high. Nevertheless, this was not the end of it all, there existed levels and realms of power above it. Not many were able to cross it but there existed a small number of masters that were able to reach tier 4. Just like with the other classes the requirements were doubled, instead of 50, a person needed 100 levels to maximize on a tier 3 class. If this man was an actual tier 4 class holder would mean that his level was at minimum 351. This was not something a person possessing a battle class could achieve easily without tossing themselves into countless battles and surviving. Yet the feeling of the chasm between them didn't go away. Could this person truly be this monstrous? Ho! Oh, impressive. The man called out while going even closer, to Roland's surprise aft. Er the eyes stare down that he did not break the man's armor began glowing. This glow was similar to his own and was followed by mystical characters similar to runes glowing on that golden armor. This magical effect took shape fast and surrounded both him and the Inquisitor in a small magical bubble that seemed to be meant to keep people from the outside from peeking in. Not bad, I guess if you're related to that old bastard then it makes sense. Huh? Old bastard? The man in shiny armor moved closer and placed his hand on Roland's armored shoulder. At first, it seemed that he wanted to help him up but instead, he delivered a smack to it which sent him down to the ground. I must thank you for keeping my stupid grandchild safe. I told her to be careful when dealing with those cult bastards but does she ever listen to her old man? His armor shook violently as the man's large mitt hit him. It felt like he was hit by a baseball bat, if he was not a high level tier 2 class holder then his shoulder would ha. Vaba neither broken or dislocated instantly. Grandchild? Dita you mean Lorena? The same, I got her letter and rushed over. She said that she was aided by a man in armor and to think it was someone like you? Tell me boy. How does that old bastard Wentworth fare? Are you his son? Or perhaps a grandchild? You do look similar but luckily you aren't half as ugly as him, ho ho ho. The man was overly chatty for some reason and started laughing as if he was a certain fat old man dressed in red. Yet after one name was mentioned it sent Roland's mind spinning, Wentworth was the name of his father. By how this old man was referring to him by his name and even calling him an old bastard then they had to be old friends. Is this some kind of old war comrade of my father? This could be bad. Will he try to drag me back to the estate? Wait. He probably only saw my last name but he doesn't actually know who I am. It was clear that the Inquisitor here had seen his status page. This was the first time the magical item that he received from the gnome had failed him. He had to consider that his whole name of Roland Arden was known to him. The man seemed to recognize his facial features that were also similar to his father's which made it hard to dodge the assumption. Claiming that he was from some faraway family would be hard if he looked similar to Wentworth Arden. Yet this brought another question to Roland's mind, should he actually care about his father finding him at this point? He had already gone down the path of the runesmith that would make it impossible for him to become a knight. Would he even be forced to abandon his current home? He was a lowly fourth son of a baron with not much worth. Normally his fate would have been to join the Knight Academy like his older brother Robert. There he would become a soldier to slowly gain merits and finally probably be forced to marry a daughter of a merchant or some lower noble to garner better relations. But with his current status as a runesmith, this path would be H.R. to proceed in. He had no proper training when it came to noble relations so his family would probably wish to hide his presence at this point. 
It wouldn't be strange if they just left him in the backwater village just like Arthur Valerian was sent away. Man of a few words. You really do take after him. Roland is it? Was there a brat with a name like that or are you perhaps? While Roland was racking his brain about his response the man continued to talk. It seemed before he could even answer the Inquisitor came to some kind of conclusion as he smacked his shoulder yet again. Oh, so that's it. That scoundrel. It must have been hard for you. Huh? To think that bastard would go around producing more offspring than he already has, he really is an ogre. Um. What? The more the man talked the more he was confused. For some reason, the high-ranking church member he was facing had a vivid imagination. Without being able to remember Wentworth's children he presumed that Roland was a bastard son made out of wedlock. This was not uncommon as many noble sired children that they let out in the world to fend for themselves. This made Wentworth Arden look bad but was a good resolution to the situation. Don't worry boy, when I meet your father I'll be sure to. No please don't. The old man started shaking his fist while talking but before he could continue Roland shouted out to stop him. He did not want to have this scary man go to his father, one mention of his name would reveal his secret. Even though he wasn't as afraid of meeting up with his old man again as he was in the past, this was something that he still wished to postpone as much as he could. The best would be after he achieved tier 3 status and would not be that easily bullied. Is that so? It seems that you do not wish me to speak to that bastard of a father of yours, very well. This old man will do so. Ah? Uh, yes, thank you. To his surprise, the man was quick to accept the proposal but even then Roland was not sure what would happen if he ever met his father. How deep was their relationship and how often did they run into each other? The man was a high-level church inquisitor that could even order noble armies around. He probably did not have that much time on his hands to talk and he could not see how his stoic father would enjoy the company of a blabbermouth like this. You must forgive this old man, your name brought back old forgotten memories. What I wished to ask you was not about your lineage but about the abyssal cult, Lorena's letter brought some things to light but I would like to hear your recount of the event. Yes sir. Sir? Just call me Bartholomew. Um, Sir Bartholomew then. Ho ho, have it your way then. After receiving a few more smacks to his poor shoulder that felt like it was about to break Roland gave a recount of the situation. It was a very similar tale to what he told Lorena but this time around he was a lot more nervous. Even though this man was acting like a nice grandfather it could have been all an act. Dot he was also an inquisitor that probably had experience in interrogating people, perhaps he would see through his lies if he tried. This he avoided by constructing his sentences in such a way that he would not be caught lying. Instead of mentioning his debugging skill he only confirmed that he found the core room to disable the illusion. Lorena's self-named grandfather just kept nodding all the way until he was finished with the story. I see, I must thank you again. But I also must ask you to keep this a secret. Of course. I didn't think that I would meet such a lad like you here, a reward is called for but I did not take anything worthwhile with. If I may speak? Oh go ahead, do you have something in mind? Yes, if it's a reward. Could you keep my involvement in this incident a secret? Ho, oh, you do not wish to be named? I see very well. Roland took the opportunity to ask for a small favor. Riches was not what he wanted but if his name could be kept from the records then perhaps it could LD keep him safe in the future. After meeting this man he realized that this incident could be bigger than he anticipated. This whole region could turn into a fighting ground as the cultists would surely not allow the church to get their hands on their relic. This has been a good talk but I must now be on my way, those cultist snakes have to be taken care of. Roland was not sure about what conversation he was talking about as it was mostly one-sided babbling from the old man. Even when he tried to give a recount of what happened he was interrupted many times. Luckily it seemed that he was in no danger of being taken in for further questioning as the barrier around them was removed. Everyone, we are leaving. Bartholomew moved back towards his horse while everyone else kept quiet. The church knights started moving back into formation towards the area where the cultist run village was. Before leaving there was another lucky turn of events as this was not the end of the man's orders. You belong to the sea. Itty guard, right? Why yes sir inquisitor. He called out to the leader of the knights that had come here first. You shall come with us, we need more able men to contend with this blight. But the lord has ordered us to. You dare refuse the order of the inquisitor? The knight that was here quickly shrunk back as the same church knight that previously shouted at Roland turned towards him now. 
Bartholomew had the power to force forces like this to move on his own accord. I dare not. But what about these? They do not belong to the cult, I feel no presence of the abyss here let them pass. Bartholomew put on his helmet and after glancing in Roland's direction, for a moment his eyes focused on the young man before he signaled his horse to move forward. The rumbling of hoofs resumed as the whole place cleared out, even the hired mercenaries and adventurers followed after the church knights that were the leading force here. Wayland. What? How? The predicament was over and almost instantly the adventurers swarmed around Roland. They all started shouting and asking questions. How was it possible for an adventurer like him to catch the eye of an inquisitor? It was baffling to them but to the man himself, it wasn't much different. What just happened here? Roland could only shrug his shoulders as he didn't know how to react. Was he supposed to be shocked, stressed, or reassured that the scary inquisitor didn't burn him at the stake? One thing was for sure, he needed to get out of here quickly and get back to his home.